Astonishing Legends Network. Listen to the Astonishing Junk Drawer exclusively at patreon.com slash astonishing legends. Trish has already made a comment. Ask us almost anything. Trying to find pictures of love cakes that are appropriate. If you're going to that degree, is that a red flag? Like just maybe someone else. No one's breaking into your uh, into your bedroom wearing your pajamas. Yeah, and I know another stalker. Well, I'll bet there's a lot of good vitamins in there. The good old days weren't always good. The serial number on it matches the provenance or the manifest of one of the planes in Flight 19. The dog in the 1970s version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I can't do any voices. Astonishing Legends is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on this podcast. Astonishing Legends would like to thank BetterHelp, Factor, our contributors at Patreon.com, and you, our listeners, for making tonight's show possible. Two weeks ago, we introduced you to the stranger who joins those in desperate times, the phantom guide or unseen companion known colloquially as the third man. We told you how the third man isn't always necessarily the third person present or necessarily a man at all. He or she is more than that. They are a safe harbor in a storm, an angel of protection that may manifest as someone the experiencer has never known or more frighteningly, as a departed acquaintance or loved one whose guidance or mere presence provides aid and comfort in a time of great danger or need. Tonight, we'll share more of these astonishing cases with you, dear listeners, and this being part two of our series on it, we'll then break into our theories on what we think third man syndrome might actually be. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess. I am the pilot of the Pinta, come to aid you. Lie quiet, Senor Captain, and I will guide your ship tonight. You have a calentura, but you will be all right tomorrow. A ghostly captain manning the helm of Joshua Slocum's sailboat, the Spray, as he lay violently ill on the floor of his cabin while sailing alone around the world in 1895. Join us tonight for part two of our series on the Third Man Syndrome. And we're back. That we are, folks. We just have a few very quick notes for housekeeping tonight. Uh, Firstly, Tess has resurrected our email Mm. newsletter, which you can subscribe to right at the bottom of our homepage at astonishingledges.com. And the latest one was chock full of super cool stuff, like overviews of our most recent series on the Ghost of Mm. Versailles and the Lost City of Akakor. And our most exciting news, the launch of Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf, which drops two days after this episode posts. So that's Monday, March 25th, 2024, for episode one of Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf. Fantastic. You know, folks, there's a method in Rich's madness. March 25th is John Keel's birthday, and Rich actually got to meet and talk to John Keel in person when he was adapting the Mothman prophecies for the big screen. Very cool. Uh, Rich's podcast is already available to subscribe to on pretty much every platform, so look for Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf wherever you get your podcasts. And a quick note here, when people ask what John Keel is like, because they, they know of him, Rich said, well, mostly you talk to him, you know, any pearls of wisdom, any any uh, the Fortean droplets of uh, just enlightenment? And he said, no, it's pretty much like, uh, what's for dinner tonight? That was... <laughs> He's, he's a regular, regular guy. He's a regular yeah. guy. Uh, he's they're shopping guy. at the grocery store, a little, you know, with Rich, just like everything else, which that warms my heart. Oh, another quick thing, Scott. Uh, yes. Our good friend, Marie Mayhew, told me that uh, she saw me recently on the Black Dahlia episode of History's Greatest Mysteries. Uh, she said I was uh, listed as a crime podcaster. Ugh, so, they <laughs> screwed the credits up again. No, 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 it's okay. People <laughs> probably didn't know uh, that's uh, one of my many talents. Uh, even, even I didn't know that. So <laughs> I want to see that. Anyway. I haven't seen it myself, but you've now been, thanks to History's Greatest Mysteries, oh, yeah. you've been a journalist, a crime podcaster, <laughs> and then, of course, a Whatever this uh, is. podcaster on Astonishing Legends. Though. I suppose so. Like I said, I could, you could just flash the name of the podcast, leave my name off of it. I would have been happy. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, folks, you can go ahead and subscribe to Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf because the trailer is already up there in his feed, and you will hear that in tonight's episode, too. Additionally, Astonishing Legend subscribers will get the first episode of Rich's show next Wednesday, March 27th, 2024. So we'll be rolling that out in our RSS feed as well. And for those of you who don't know what that is, which is a term that they're using less mm. and less these days, that just means the uh, pipeline that all our podcasts are published by so oh, that, right. that you're hopefully subscribed to and if you're not please subscribe to it no oh, yeah i guess it still matters leave a decent review too if you would apparently yeah. that also still matters well in other news tess our de facto manager o merch has kicked scott out of that position for the astonishing legend store and has recently launched an al spring sale with steep discounts and a lot of the stuff in the store so get to astonishinglegends.com and click on shop and you can find a lot of astonishing bargains you know what? I particularly like those leather catch-alls with oh, the yeah, logo. I use one of those for all my car keys, and car junk is perfect. And we don't have a ton of those, folks, so move quickly. Oh, yes. They make fantastic gifts as well. Also, Scared All the Time just posted Season 2, Episode 6, or as some people like to call it, the 16th episode of the show, which is rapidly closing in on 150,000 all-time listens, if you can believe that, and it only just launched last October. So if you haven't heard it already, find and subscribe to Scared All the Time wherever you get your podcasts. It's a great show about freaky stuff that is completely different from what we do. So that's a selling point right there. <laughs> yeah, that, that it is. And I just remember both Scared All the Time and Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf are, well, I would say rated R. Not oh. all the time, occasionally, <laughs> but uh, rather than PG-13 like uh. us. So the gloves are off in a great way, so uh, listener discretion is advised. Yes, but not uh, not too crass, I don't believe. Yeah, no, no not Just a crass. little peppery. Well, yeah. and finally, <laughs> it's been a long time since we've mentioned this, but Astonishing Legends will be 10 years old this October. And even though we're closing in on that first decade, we are still very much looking for new listeners. Yeah, it turns out there's only a few ways to find new listeners on a podcast, and the top one is actually word of mouth. Mm. So if you enjoy Astonishing Legends, please tell your friends about us. We, we feel like there's a lot of folks out there that might not even realize that they would dig the genre if they just gave it a shot. Yeah, you know, it's so much easier now. Back when we started, we used to ask you guys to tell people about us, and we would add all this language in about how to uh, explain to people what a podcast was and how to listen to one. Well, that's not a thing anymore. <laughs> all you have to do, though, is say, check out the Astonishing Legends podcast, and most people should know what that is. Yeah, it, it couldn't be easier. We, we can use some more reviews, as Forrest said earlier, mm. on every platform, yes, too. True. So don't be shy, and, unless you hate us and yeah. have nothing good to say, <laughs> in which case we say shyness is a virtue. But uh, get the word out. We're trying to make a push here to grow the show to the next level so we can keep doing it and also expand the burgeoning Astonishing Legends Network. And we're taking a quick week off for spring break before our next show, so we'll be back on April 13th with a new show. All right, man, let's get tonight's episode going. Where do we dive back in? There is a note when we talked about mountain climbers and we did mention the legendary Reinhold Messner. Yes. Yeah, we did a little reading on him and he's got a lot of accolades, but there was something that we didn't mention, I think. It was on the tip of my tongue and in my notes on my notepad written down and we didn't get to it. And I think we'd be amiss if we didn't now. He claimed to have seen a Yeti. Right. <laughs> right. And that's not such a big deal, but yeah. it is to a lot of folks who claim anything about Bigfoot or Yeti. Just like, oh, come on. Now you've just yeah, lost all Yeah, he's like, oh, whatever. This third man thing, thats <laughs> it's totally your brain. Let's be rational here. Oh, by the way, I saw a Yeti once. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying is that it could yeah. flip-flop depending on what you read because this experience happened during his 1978 solo conquest of Nanga Parbat. He says, I am holding a conversation with someone who is sitting at my side. Is it human? It seems there is another presence besides my own. That is all I can say. It isn't just a voice I hear. I actually sense a physical presence, end quote. So he's saying, like, this is weird. I actually feel there's somebody there. And I thought, like, what would that feel like earlier today? It's like, well, it exactly like the wake and go stuff when you're not stressed or starving or <laughs> dying of hypothermia or on a mountain or on the ocean is a lot, a lot of people will turn around just knowing something is behind them without yeah. seeing them, just feeling it. When they turn around and nothing's there, they're even more shocked because they expected, they knew somebody was behind them and no one was. It's shocking to me in, in almost 10 years of doing the show now. Right. I can only think of really one other time that we've talked about this, but have you ever, especially alone or camping or out on your own, felt like you were being watched by something and had like a hair-raising feeling from it? 
No. Yeah, one time I was playing with a young friend in the woods near my house, and we got spooked and ran mm. home, and we right. were convinced that something was chasing us. But in hindsight, then I'm older, I think it was just kids imagining that something was behind us and chasing us because we would have been super easy to catch. <laughs> right, right. Well, <laughs> and, and nothing caught us, but, you know. A slow-moving Jason uh, from Friday the 13th. Could have yeah, been, right, you know. exactly. You no, know, I did say in, in part one, though, during the hypnopompic episode yeah. that I very rarely, but occasionally have, that one time is that I didn't really so much feel like there was a presence standing over me and I couldn't open my eyes or move any part of my body. It was the thought that somebody yeah. is standing there. And then that thought took flesh. The thought was like, oh my God, there really could be somebody standing over me. Right. And then it's like, what if they are? And so that turned into a feeling that some big entity was standing over my bed. And of course, then you, you know, you start twitching and you can wake up and you open your eyes finally and no one's there and you feel silly. And then I went to the back door and I'd left the kitchen door open. Folks, for the record, this was fairly recent. Forrest is not talking about a childhood memory here. This was not too long ago well, in, in yeah, Los Angeles, right? Yeah, let's say six, seven years ago. Yeah, I mean, no. Oh, it was that? I felt like it was more, well, it, since we've been doing the show. Yeah, it, like I said, it, what you wake up and it's not such a big deal because I didn't feel that somebody was there. In, in all my camping trips and all that stuff, I've never really, felt like eyes were on right. me or something and, and, and been scared in the in the woods or whatever. I've been, you know, freaked out that I I know there's animals out there watching right. me, but I, I never felt like they were about to strike or anything like Even that. Even so. with a contemporary, a competitor to Mesner, Polish climber Jerry Kukuzka, we did also mention him in part one, I believe, competing with him to become the first person to reach the summit of all 14 of the world's 28,000 feet peaks or 8,000 meters. And he had his own experience because, again, I've come to believe, this is something I didn't realize, is that it seems a lot more common than not, in that if you yeah. talk to five climbers, one of them's going to have a story. But Jerry Kukuzka, as we said, I experienced a quite inexplicable feeling that I was not on my own, that when he was in his tent brewing tea, he was cooking for two people. He said, I had such a strong feeling that someone else was present that I, I felt an overpowering need to talk to him as he was standing still, fighting to continue on, that he would stand there and wait for the other person to catch up. And he yeah. said, from time to time, I'd let him pass so that he could go ahead. His feat there was that he was the first person to climb Everest without oxygen. And he spent 10 years looking for what he calls a chemo and what we know as a Yeti. And he also saw one himself in Tibet. This is something I mentioned a while back in our Yeti series, which is one of my favorite series that we did with Dr. Daniel Taylor yeah. in his book on the Yeti, which is a truly a, a, an amazing book. And he was a fascinating guest. I guess that New York City has the largest Sherpa population mm, in the mm -hmm, United States. Mm -hmm. The story that I told about this was that uh, there was one time when my wife and I were had gotten in a cab and we needed to go to Brooklyn. At the time, we were living in Manhattan when it wasn't astronomically insane. I mean, it was expensive, yeah, but yeah. At that it was still attainable. So we didn't get to Brooklyn that much back then. Brooklyn's all super cool and hip now. Right, but like, right. We were we had to go over there for uh, something I think it was to party or something, and we got in a cab and we were joking about like I can't believe you know we haven't been out of Manhattan in forever, and now we're going to Brooklyn, and and then I looked up and I was like oh it's we have a Sherpa taking uh, us. These are the guides right. that you read about. I had just finished John Krakauer's book Into Thin Air, which is an uh, amazing book. Yes. I mentioned it in part one, one of one of my favorite adventure books that I, <laughs> I've read. Uh, uh -huh. And so that's where I had learned about Sherpas. I had not been to Everest myself, and I'm sure all these people that are listening who have certainly know who they are. Amazing folks who climb Everest without oxygen yeah. because they're they're from there, native yeah. to the area. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they they don't have as, as issues with that. They're the ones carrying all the stupid crap you bring when you try to go up there. Yeah, your the, cappuccino <laughs> maker. I can't remember what her what her name was, but somebody carried that for her. Yeah. Yeah, um, Pittman, Sandy Pittman, yes. the part of that famous uh, group that got stuck in a storm. Anyway, so we're riding into Brooklyn. I look up and it's like, I was like, oh, look, Emily, it's a Sherpa is taking us into Brooklyn. Okay, here's the question, though. How did you know he was a Sherpa? This was back when there were still taxis in New York. It, having just recently been, I can tell you they're all but gone. They're nearly extinct wow. now, thanks to uh, Uber. Uh, and there was a lot of turmoil around that. But uh, at this time, there were cabs everywhere, hundreds of thousands. I think there's only like 20 or 30,000 now. But there was a lot of them, and they had to have that badge right there on the little divider 
And it said right there, his last name was Sherpa. Well, that was like his <laughs> actual name was okay. Sherpa. So, yeah, well, so I was uh, like, oh, that's pretty cool. I take that as a good sign. It's a good sign. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, I definitely felt safe. I was like, no matter what happens, this guy's going to get us back to Manhattan. <laughs> Very well, then. <laughs> well, continuing on with some interesting anecdotes, this is summarized in this paper by John Geiger and Peter Sudfeld called the sensed presence as a coping resource in extreme environments. I, I promise I'll stop reading the entire title of that and just refer to it as the paper <laughs> from here on out. And once again, I believe a chapter within the book titled Miracles, God, Science, and Psychology in the Paranormal. And that sounds like a book that you and I are going to have to read at some point. Uh, yeah. Well, continuing on with fascinating cases of the third man syndrome, this next case is quite curious because if accurate, it may be evidence of the sensed presence originating from outside oneself, manifesting as a physical being that can control objects as well as provide advice and companionship. Uh, Scott, did you mention in part one here, Joshua Slocum and the 1895 uh, expedition here? I think I made reference to the fact that we were going to bring it up in part two, so I'm very glad. Oh, to see that's it right. Yes, you, uh, that's where yeah. I remember. Yes, you said we we're going to talk about it, and here we are talking about it. Well, the story goes: in 1895, Joshua Slocum sets out with a 40-foot sloop in an attempt to become the first solo navigation circumnavigation of the world, and he succeeded, but he almost didn't, and he had a you could say a very ghostly presence with him. Scott is going to read from the book because it's quite remarkable. So, Scott, why don't you let us in on, on the details of this anecdote? Okay. I, I was thrilled to find this book on the uh, Gutenberg Project, you know, right. they scan books. Uh, this is from Sailing Alone Around the World by Captain Joshua Slocum, illustrated by Thomas Fogarty and George Varian. And uh, this was published in uh, 1900, I believe. It seems to be the first modern description of the sensed presence experience. Yes. Again, from 1895, predating Shackleton. Okay. One of the things that Slocum talks about here, and by the way, this is very timely. We couldn't have planned this. You know, it's still Women's History Month. And mm -hmm. this woman, Cole Brower, just finished a race around the world. She's yeah. the first American woman to race nonstop around the world. You may have seen her on the press circuit. She's on all kinds of uh, TV shows and stuff lately. There's some very cool footage of her coming in to finish the race where she's like on the back of her boat holding uh, giant sparklers. It's so cool looking. But it, she went around the world by mm -hmm. herself and, and just made this trip. And I don't recall her saying that anything like this happened, but there's she was on socials the whole time. There's yeah. some amazing footage that she put on Instagram, including one where she's on camera and you yeah. see her body just thrown completely across the cabin, like it's in a car accident. Just unbelievable. Yeah, she was hit yeah. by a bad storm and knocked around pretty bad and could have killed you. Yeah, so uh, amazing woman. You should look that up. Her name is Cole, C-O-L-E, Brower, B-R-A-U-E-R. -E but one of the segments here in this book that Slocum wrote about this trip, I want to start here where he says, the loneliness of my state wore off when the gale was high and I found much work to do. When fine weather returned, then came the sense of solitude, which I could not shake off. I used my voice often, at first giving some order about the affairs of a ship, for I had been told that from disuse I should lose my speech. At the meridian altitude of the sun, I called out aloud, eight bells after the custom on a ship at sea. Again from my cabin, I cried to an imaginary man at the helm, how does she head there? And again, is she on her course? But getting no reply, I was reminded the more palpably of my condition. My voice sounded hollow on the empty air, and I dropped the practice. So that's the first introduction to this. And a little mm -hmm. bit later, he writes the passage that is most frequently referred to in reference to third man syndrome or third man factor, if you're talking about uh, Geiger's book. I set sail from Horta early on July 24th, and I'm pretty sure this was 1895. The southwest wind at the time was light, but squalls came up with the sun, and I was glad enough to get reefs in my sails before I had gone a mile. I had hardly set the mainsail, double reefed when a squall of wind down the mountains struck the sloop with such violence that I thought her mast would go. However, a quick helm brought her to the wind. As it was, one of the weather lanyards was carried away and the other was stranded. My tin basin, caught up by the wind, went flying across a French school ship to leeward. It was more or less squally all day, sailing alone under high land. But rounding close under a bluff, I found an opportunity to mend the lanyards broken in the squall. 
Passing the island of Pico after the rigging was mended, the spray, which is the name of his, his boat, stretched across to leeward of the island of St. Michael's, which he was up with early on the morning of July 26, the wind blowing hard. Later in the day, she passed the Prince of Monaco's fine steam yacht bound to Fayal, where on a previous voyage, the prince had slipped his cables to, quote, escape a reception, which the padres of the island wished to give him. Why he so dreaded the ovation, I could not make out. At Horta, they did not know. Since reaching the islands, I had lived most luxuriously on fresh bread, butter, vegetables, and fruits of all kinds. Plums seemed the most plentiful on the spray, and these I ate without stint. I had also a Pico white cheese that General Manning, <laughs> the American Consul General, mm. had given me, which I supposed was to be eaten, and of this I partook with the plums. Alas! Exclamation point. <laughs> By nighttime, I was doubled up with cramps. The wind, which was already a smart breeze, was increasing somewhat with a heavy sky to the southwest. Reefs had been turned out, and I must turn them in again somehow. And for folks who have sailing experience, you know what that means. If you don't, reefing a sail means actually reducing the sail area by uh, mm. taking it down or reducing its size because the wind is so high that if you don't, you're going to break your mast or Ooh. tear the sail or yeah. have more serious problems. So it's just about reducing your sail area so that you can keep the boat more controllable. And that would indicate that you're in a uh, high wind and, and possibly a dangerous situation. Between cramps, I got the mainsail down hauled out the earrings as best I could and tied away point by point in the double reef. There being sea room, I should, in strict prudence, have made all snug and gone down at once to my cabin. I am a careful man at sea, but this night, in the coming storm, I swayed up my sails, which reefed though they were, were still too much in such heavy weather, and I saw to it that the sheets were securely belayed. In a word, I should have laid too, but did not. I gave her the double reefed mainsail and the whole jib instead and set her on her course. Then I went below and threw myself upon the cabin floor in great pain. How long I lay there, I could not tell, for I became delirious. When I came to, as I thought from my swoon, I realized that the sloop was plunging into a heavy sea and looking out of the companionway, to my amazement, I saw a tall man at the helm. His rigid hand grasping the spokes of the wheel held them as in a vice. One may imagine my astonishment. His rig was that of a foreign sailor, and the large red cap he wore was cockbilled over his left ear, and all was set off with shaggy black whiskers. He would have been taken for a pirate in any part of the world. While I gazed upon his threatening aspect, I forgot the storm and wondered if he had come to cut my throat. This he seemed to divine. Senor, said he, doffing his cap, I have come to do you no harm. And a smile, the faintest in the world, but still a smile played on his face, which seemed not unkind when he spoke. I have come to do you no harm. I have sailed free, he said, but was never worse than a contrabandista. I am one of Columbus's crew, he continued. I am the pilot of the Pinta, come to aid you. Lie quiet, senor captain, he added, and I will guide your ship tonight. You have a calentura, but you will be all right tomorrow. Calentura, I had to look that up. That's a fever. <laughs> oh, it means some other things too, but oh. in this case, it means a fever. Uh -huh. yes. I thought, what a very devil he was to carry sail. Again, as if he read my mind, he exclaimed, Yonder is the Pinta ahead. We must overtake her. Give her sail. Give her sail. Vale, vale, muy vale. Biting off a large quid of black twist, he said, you did wrong, Captain, to mix cheese with plums. <laughs> White cheese is never safe unless you know whence it comes. Quien sabe? It may have been from leche de capra and becoming capricious. Avast there, I cried. I have no mind for moralizing. <laughs> I made shift to spread a mattress and lie on that instead of the hard floor, my eyes all the while fastened on my strange guest, who, remarking again that I would have, quote, only pains in calentura, chuckled as he chanted a wild song. High are the waves, fierce, gleaming, high is the tempest roar, high the seabird screaming, high the azure. I suppose I was now on the men, for I was peevish and complained. I detest your jingle. Your azure should be at roost and would have been were it a respectable bird. I begged he would tie a rope yarn on the rest of the song if there was any more of it. I was still in agony. Great seas were boarding the spray, but in my fevered brain, I thought they were boats falling on deck. 
that careless draymen were throwing from wagons on the pier to which I imagined the spray was now moored and without fenders to breast her off. You'll smash your boats, I called out again and again as the seas crashed on the cabin over my head. You'll smash your boats, but you can't hurt the spray. She is strong, I cried. I found when my pains and Kalantura had gone that the deck, now as white as a shark's tooth from seas washing over it, had been swept of everything movable. To my astonishment, I saw now at broad day that the spray was still heading as I had left her and was going like a racehorse. Columbus himself could not have held her more exactly on her course. The sloop had made 90 miles in the night through a rough sea. I felt grateful to the old pilot but I marveled some that he had not taken in the jib. The gale was moderating and by noon the sun was shining. A meridian altitude and the distance on the patent log, which I always kept towing, told me that she had made a true course throughout the 24 hours. I was getting much better now, but was very weak and did not turn out reefs that day or the night following, although the wind fell light. But I just put my wet clothes out in the sun when it was shining and lying down there myself fell asleep. Then who should visit me again but my old friend of the night before? This time, of course, in a dream. Mm. You did well last night to take my advice, said he. And if you would, I should like to be with you often on the voyage for the love of adventure alone. Finishing what he had to say, he again doffed his cap and disappeared as mysteriously as he came, returning, I suppose, to the Phantom Pinta. I awoke much refreshed and with the feeling that I had been in the presence of a friend and a seaman of vast experience. I gathered up my clothes, which by this time were dry. Then by inspiration, I threw overboard all of the plums in the vessel. <laughs> what, just got rid of a delicious charcuterie? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty amazing though. And this, this is why I love going to the source on this stuff because mm. in, in the books you read or the, or the articles that are citing it back, it's like, they're a little bit cherry, or in this case, plum picking the parts that tell the story uh. that they want you to hear. But for me, in a lot of ways, when you go back to the full segment there of what he wrote, mm -hmm. you are getting the big picture. You're getting that before this all happened, he was talking to himself and he knew he was doing that. And right, he was doing right. that because he had heard that if I go to sea and don't talk for a long time, I'm not going to remember how to talk anymore. So he started that's, doing that. Hey, that's a little like what we were talking about with the uh, suddenly uh, Van Halen 2 album playing in your head. If yeah, I got exactly. nothing, get no stimulus, we're going to shut this down. And then uh, we're going to be playing albums <laughs> that you may have forgotten about, but I've heard. Uh, <laughs> what would be odd is hearing an album that you've never heard before. Yeah. And then hearing it later. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. A lot of people worry about money, and I'm definitely one of those people, but these days I've truly come to cherish free time almost as much, if not more than a little extra money. I know what you mean. <laughs> you and I both have hectic schedules, my friend, and then family obligations, and it's a lot to keep up with. I think a lot of people think about having more time. Like, what if we just had a little more of it? And, and also, if time was unlimited, what would you do with it? I mean, for me, sometimes I just want to meditate or chill out, mm. but I also want to have more time with my family and my son who's growing up so fast, I oh, honestly yeah. can't believe it. But for a workaholic like me, the best way to manage time and get more free time is to figure out what's important and make that a priority. Therapy can help you find what matters the most to you so you can do more of that thing. Make the time for it. Yeah, I think everyone knows that feeling of working a particular job a long time, and, and when you make a change, regardless of why, whether you're fired, quit, or maybe the place you're working at closes, not too long after that, you realize how much of a bubble you were in. It's like you were in a rut you didn't recognize, and, and as a result, maybe you've spent a lot of time on things you wish you'd save for something else. Totally. I know that's happened to me where I'm just not even aware of the things I'm doing that are detrimental to my life, mm. wasting time on stuff that really isn't important in the grand scheme of things. Therapy helps you fix that. It helps you identify those things you can't see in your own life. It's been a while for me since I've been in any kind of therapy, but the therapy I did do left me with some revelations that completely changed how I interact with my family. And I still think about what I learned from that to this day. I had no idea some of the negative things I was doing, and I can honestly say that it improved my personal relationships and it helped me realize that I need to work on some things. Mm. As a result of that, I improved the quality of time I had with my family and also my personal stress levels. Oh, well, you know, that's pretty cool. I like that. Yeah, it is. So uh, folks, if you're thinking about getting a little perspective on your life that might help you identify priorities and make more time for yourself, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, 
flexible, and available for you on your schedule. You just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched up with a licensed therapist. And by the way, you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Visit BetterHelp.com Astonishing today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash astonishing. Hey, man, do you ever find yourself eating the same meals over and over sometimes? Uh, yeah, that happens. I have some staples that I wind up circling back to. Yeah, probably not the healthiest choices. Probably not. Well, eating better is actually pretty easy with Factors ready-to-eat meals. Every fresh, never-frozen meal is chef-crafted, dietitian approved and ready to go in just two minutes. That's right. With Factor, you'll have over 35 different options to choose from every week, including Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. Also, there are more than 60 add-ons to help you stay fueled up and feeling good all day long. You can have a restaurant-quality meal in just two minutes. They're ready to heat and eat wherever you are. They even have breakfast foods like pancakes, smoothies, and more. Mmm, you know, there's no prep and no mess, so there's nothing to cook or clean up. And you can choose your meals every week, and you have the flexibility to pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, premium options with no cooking required. Yeah, see, Scott, I bet you thought you were a cook because you used a microwave. Well, I guess, yeah, that's just heating and not cooking. But I I'm okay with not cooking <laughs> these days. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you on that, and that's the rule of every office mini kitchen. You are allowed to heat food. You are not allowed to cook food. So this would be perfect. There you go. It's two different things. Yeah. Well, we've done the math here. Well, Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious. Sign up now and save. Head to factormeals.com slash AL50. That's the number five zero and use code AL50 to get 50% off. That's code AL50 at factormeals.com slash AL50 to get 50% off. This is Yafit Leeds from Leeds Point, New Jersey. And when I'm not hunting the Jersey Devil... I'll listen to Astonishing Legends. Now, let's get back to the show with Scott and Forrest. He was talking to himself, but then he stopped talking to himself, but then he gets sick. He's in the storm. He sees this character and has conversations, interactive conversations with him, which is the same thing we heard from the Mountaineers, that they were having conversations. Right. But they didn't always see the third man. Sometimes they sensed the right, person. Right. This was something that he said he saw. Now, maybe he's just putting color into his book, but it seems real specific. Mm -hmm. It is also, I would say, somewhat of a miracle that the vessel, the spray, stayed on her course for 90 miles through a storm mm -hmm. while he was below. If he did not tie off the helm, at the very least... Even if you were tying down the, the boom and the sails and everything, in a storm, the wind is shifting. Like, yeah. I don't know how that would have worked, but I did find some interesting information mm -hmm. about the spray, the ship he was on. If you go and you look up Joshua Slocum and his trip around the world, uh, when he did this, a solo trip around the world on the sailboat, the spray was kind of a derelict vessel. It was not meant to be an ocean going, you know, blue water boat, as they might say these days. This is what it says on the Wikipedia page about it, though. And this is something to take into account when you hear this story. Spray was remarkable for its ability to hold its course for hours or days on end. Sailboat designer John G. Hanna said of Spray, quote, I hold that her peculiar merit as a single hander was in her remarkable balance of all effective centers of effort and resistance on her midship section line but cautioned that Spray was, quote, the worst possible boat for anyone lacking the experience and resourcefulness of Slocum, end quote. Cipriano Andrade Jr., an engineer and yacht designer, said of Spray, quote, after a thorough analysis of Spray's lines, I found her to have a theoretically perfect balance. Her balance is marvelous, almost uncanny. Try as I would, one element after another, they all swung into the same identical line, end quote. Slocum himself praised his sloop as, quote, easily balanced and easily kept in trim, end quote. So that's the big picture there. Mm -hmm. So you hear the story, you hear what he experienced, you hear that this vessel was very good at maintaining a straight line. Right, right. Still, I would say at sea in a storm overnight, 90 miles, 
and staying on course while you're below deck throwing up and God knows what else is happening with the food yeah. poisoning, that's still a pretty magical feat. And then coming back around for us as we get into theories later in this episode, what's going on here? Because there's a difference between this and what's needing to happen on that vessel for it to maintain its course and just being tired in the snow and having a conversation with what you perceive mm-hmm. as an additional ghostly person who's with you and accompanying you. There's a lot that needs to be going on here. And had he not had this companion, he would have had to maybe tie everything down, tie off the helm yeah. and hope it would stay on course while he recovered below, which you think he would just point out. He would say, oh, I, you know, I tied a line off to the helm to keep the rudder where yeah. it needed to be amidships or whatever, depending on the current, I set the sails and the jib and tied everything off and I just went below and hoped that I would feel better. He didn't say any of that. He just like, I was down below and I looked up and this dude was selling the boat for me. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's yeah. one. And again, I'm not taking the whole of the descriptions and charting them out is how many were there were the, the person experiencing it saw somebody or just felt them or heard voices or just it was telepathy in their head you know like there's all these variations yeah. which may not mean anything i mean it's like somebody trying to pick apart your ghost story like well you, but, yeah. but most people say this it's like you you know what you experienced you don't need right. somebody to qualify it but it's interesting that he saw him which most people have the sense presence they cook them food they talk to them they expect to see them there and just don't but even when they don't it's not like that feeling goes away either. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, well, there's nobody there. And then your brain, uh, you know, let's say even with a ghost experience, it's like, oh, there's nothing there. Well, then that feeling may go away. Here, even if they don't see them or hear them, they just know that they're there. So that feeling persists up until the moment when things are safe. Then it vanishes, as we said before. But here's quite interesting that not only did he see them, but he returns in a dream. Yeah. Sorry, I just thought about a uh, a Mitch Hedberg joke. I like sleeping, but I hate dreaming because I'm relaxing. And then the next thing I know, I have to build a go-kart with my (laughs) ex-landlord. It's like, that's the rant. That's the joke about the randomness of dreams. It's like, why am I doing this? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, Okay. Here, the pilot, he continues on and says, I I very much enjoyed our our trip together. I wish to come back and uh, experience the uh, adventure. Yeah, And so that's a continuation. Again, you could say, well, that's all part of it. He's just imagining this. Here's another thing about that story, because uh, according to the paper here, Slocum, right before his illness, had been reading Washington Irving's Life of Columbus. Right. And then he convinced himself that the presence was the pilot of the Pinta. And when he finally recovered, after 48 hours, he found the sloop on its correct course, as we said, for Gibraltar. And then he goes on to say that he had been in the presence of a friend and a seaman of vast experience. This friend reappeared later in Slocum's journey, not only just in dream form, but again, that he's a friend. And then if you say like, well, if he is doubled over with food poisoning, how likely is it that he's actually doing this stuff in his delirium and getting it right? And then the other thing is that he's surprised about the jib that like, well, well, I wouldn't have done that, but okay. You're yeah. All right, you sail for Columbus, fine. That, and by the way, that's a lot of sail out in a storm. And again, for people who don't know sailing, the jib is the sail that's uh, forward of the mast right. and like you would see it out in the front. You put that out when you're in great conditions and yeah. the, you want to go fast. Right, right. Maybe not when there's a storm happening. <laughs> right. And then you say, I like the cut of your jib. Yeah, I just, I want to point something out that I'd only just now looked up, by the way. The actual captain of the Penta was Martin Alonso Pinzon. Oh, Yeah. Spanish mariner, shipbuilder, navigator, explorer, oldest of the Pinzon brothers. He sailed with Christopher Columbus on his first voyage to the New World in 1492. And apparently there's a French tradition that says that he had sailed to the New World with navigator Jean Cousin and that they discovered the continent four years before Columbus. Right. Of course, there's all kinds of stories like that about that stuff. But uh, interesting. It doesn't describe if he had black whiskers or what he looked like. Let's see. Here's a picture of Columbus and Pinzon. In a painting, hmm, I don't know. He does look kind of like the guy. Of course, the painting will predate yeah. Slocum's trip. So if Slocum saw the painting, he could be like, it's the guy from the painting. So there's yeah. that. But. <laughs> but that's with any good story, especially if you're going to go the literary route, where at yeah. the end of the story, and again, it's a bit of a trope in an old chestnut, is that the person sees a little bit of evidence that makes you doubt. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, yeah. maybe it's from that. And then if you're really good, you have another one that makes you doubt the doubting. Well, 
not all people are saved as the anecdotes go on. Sometimes, uh, again, in these stories of ocean travel, you have people who are stranded a lot of the time, so they, they don't make it. So it's even more of a stress condition. But the ones that are more, even more brutal, if you can imagine, are the people that are sent adrift alone yes. on the ocean uh, by themselves and get real down to the wire here. And yeah. in one story, uh, 1953, two deserters from the French Foreign Legion deserted en route to Vietnam. And then they were basically on a small raft in the Strait of Malacca. And it's a busy shipping lane, but nobody saw them. And they started to drift into the Indian Ocean. And now they have no provisions. They're starving. They're dehydrated. Sharks are chasing them. And during the 32-day ordeal, one of the men, a Swede, died. But the other person, a Finn, a 24-year-old named Encio Tira, survived. And he said, uh, for the whole voyage, I had the strange feeling that someone else was with me, watching over me, and keeping me safe from harm. So not for everybody. He didn't make it. Now, here's a story that we talked about in part one I was going to allude to in that <laughs> this guy's, this is something I might try, not actually go through with it, but think about it. Uh, it's a solo sailor, a German doctor named Hannes Lindemann, Hans or Hans Lindemann. And he was out on this crazy solo Atlantic crossing in a 17-foot rubberized canvas folding boat. <laughs> Good he, Lord. And he had a theory, he's going to test it out, that self-mastery and hypnotic and autogenic meditation techniques, this would aid his psychological state during the voyage. And again, I thought like, oh, you know, I'll bet if I uh, get some uh, aimed and guided meditations in there, I could do this too. By the way, I'm just quickly going to say that in looking at a picture of this guy yeah. in his boat, and it looks like essentially a sunfish that somebody <laughs> turned into a yeah. Gilligan's Island boat. Well, there you go. That is nuts. That's crazy. What I was going to say, his companion was African. And he said, yes. uh, as he would wake up, he looked around for his companion and then realized no one else was there with him. So it was continuing on through the whole journey, but I'm not really sure that he was in that much danger other than it's just perilous. And I'm sure yeah. you're alone and scared. Yeah. Another gentleman, Dr. David Lewis, also tried a single-handed transatlantic sailing race in 1960, but he was going to conduct medical research uh, he kept a daily log and it was recording the amount of, uh, you know, his responses to danger, exhaustion, all that. And near the Grand Banks, uh, he had the feeling that he was not alone and that another person was at the helm. The Grand Banks, by the way, another amazing adventure book by um, Sebastian Younger, The right. Perfect Storm. Uh, yeah, that's, that's where right. all yeah. that stuff went down. Yeah. Well, the Atlantic, as a sailor told me, the Pacific uh, matches its name, pacified, peaceful. Yes. Atlantic, not so much. Very, very tall seas there. In another crossing, you have some uh, knowledge about this, but uh, American Robert Mannery was trying a solo Atlantic crossing. And again, here's another reason why this might be in his head. He was taking some stay awake pills, as they call them. Then, yeah. Uh, because yeah. of the conditions, because if you fall asleep, you can die and you don't see what's happening to your boat. But he said that he was not alone. And he said someone, quote, a man uh, was on Tinkerbell with me. That's the name of the boat. He was friendly, Mannery says. And he, he never spoke aloud to his friend, but he said he did converse in a miraculous, soundless way. And at some point, the man took over the tiller from an exhausted mannery, and he felt he, quote, became a passenger. So that's another example of somebody stepping in to take over the tiller or the wheel of the boat and do the work. Rather than him doing it like the guy saying, like, okay, to the left, you want to do this? Yeah. All right. Take a bearing. Now I'm talking like a pirate. I won't do that. But <laughs> but the idea that like you're still in control, these are cases where it's like, no, no, I was totally not in control. This other specter was. A couple of things about the Tinkerbell. First of all, when you look at this boat, mm -hmm. when you look at this vessel, it looks pretty much exactly like the little plastic toy sailboat that you had in your <laughs> bathtub when you were four. It right. is another really wild trip that somebody took. Apparently it was the shortest, but not the smallest boat to yeah. cross the Atlantic. Today, the smallest is still Lindemann's folding kayak. But the Tinkerbell, <laughs> it does. It looks like a toy. Yeah, it looks like yeah. a toy. It's like uh, Charlie Parker playing great tunes on a toy saxophone. Like he will still <laughs> show you up on a toy. As I always thought, like if you could win the Tour de France riding Pee Wee Herman's Schwinn. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, anyway, shipwreck survivors, those stories are 
much more harrowing, I think, just because of the torture that's drawn out. And in, and in one case here, you get a visitor who is of a different kind, not just a manifestation, more of a traditional one in the sense that it may have been a ghost or something like that. In one case during World War II, a torpedo attack slams into a merchant marine ship. 14 merchant sailors become stranded, adrift, on the Atlantic Ocean for 50 days, and only two survived. And one of the two survivors, Kenneth Cook, said that a young crewmate who had died on the 25th day had returned and spoke with him on several occasions, telling Cook that some of the men would survive. Now, this communication from beyond the watery grave had kept Cook alive, as in one moment when he thought he would throw himself overboard to put an end to his agony. So again, that's not just some unseen person or mom. It's somebody who just died on the ship. But that kept him going, you know what I'm saying? And and maybe if somebody was trying to say that to you, they would not say you're going to be the lone survivor because right. that might also depress you. And it's like, survivor's guilt, I can't be the only one surviving. I'm just going to yeah. end it. And uh, somebody said, no, 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 keep going, keep going on. You need to live. You got you to gotta keep going. And that's yeah. what happened. In another case, five people adrift in a dinghy on the Pacific Ocean one woman survivor said she counted seven people in the boat and that this extra presence behind her in the boat had helped them survive a storm. In a study of survival at sea, two researchers, E.C.B. Lee and Kenneth Lee, reported that the phenomenon was quite common, stating, quote, there are many instances where survivors have felt an unseen presence helping and comforting them. So again, that's another thing developing here with this story is that it's pretty common, which also makes it very strange, much more so, I would say, than people seeing a ghost, Bigfoot, or UFOs. In the ranking of where this happens most, we're following along here. So it's mountain climbers, and then I think ocean travelers, and now polar explorers, as you so noted in part one. And perhaps the most famous case of the third man syndrome was Sir Ernest Shackleton and his two companions, Thomas Crean, or Crean, and Frank Worsley's experience during their harrowing 1914 and 1917 Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition. But not as well known, and at the other end of the globe in the Arctic during the same era, there was another expedition ship that got trapped and crushed in the ice. And the crew also experienced the third man. Now, there were 23 non-Inuit crew members and scientists, and 11 of them perished from cold and starvation. Of the survivors, there was one passenger and seven Inuit who were on board, with two of the Inuit being children. And this sense of presence or third man figure also took on religious significance for the survivors. And even though this was up at the North Pole, that just highlights how significant it was that Sir Ernest Shackleton managed to get everyone that right. left with him home alive. Again, you could say, or you could chalk that up to bad supplies, but danger and this treachery happen, well, it continues to this day. It doesn't matter because no, no matter how well equipped you are, you can get caught suddenly and find yourself in a very uh, perilous situation, as did Alan Parker in 1968, uh, March, who was working as a carpenter with a sub-Antarctic Australian possession on Macquarie Island. John Geiger interviewed him in 2005, as he did Reinhold Messner. Not that same yes. year, but he was able to, uh, Geiger was able to interview Messner. Well, Parker was trapped in a severe storm, wide out, with sideways rain and sleet. He knew with near zero visibility that he was in imminent danger, having become disoriented and not knowing which direction to get back to base camp. And he was starting to feel hopeless when he sensed the presence of someone else there with him saying, don't worry, keep going. And this didn't frighten him as he knew whatever it was was there to help. And once the winds and whiteout died down, the presence left. I want to say something for about the whiteouts, which is really fascinating. I was going to ask you if you've ever to... been in one. No, oh. <laughs> I have not been in a whiteout. Yeah. But again, going back to Into Thin Air, the Krakauer book about the ill-fated Everest expedition that got caught in a storm, there are some really frightening stories oh, about yeah. them because I seem to remember I read it a long time ago. It came out a long time ago. Whatever year it came out, that's the year I read it, sometime after 2001, mm -hmm. maybe five, six, something like that. One of the things that was amazing about it was one of the people on that expedition on Everest, they got caught in a whiteout. And they got disoriented like that and couldn't find their way back. And I think they either died or they were found with severe frostbite mm. after the storm yeah. had passed. They were like 10 feet from a tent. He was totally lost mm -hmm. and couldn't see it. Couldn't see it. In these cases, though, is that you, you do have some delirium 
but not always. Yeah. And in more recent times, as it's described by more modern explorers, more contemporary modern day explorers, of course, most of them attribute the experience to psychological or physiological causes. Unlike Shackleton or McKinley's experience, in 1998, Peter Hillary went on a South Polar expedition in which he reported sensing the presence of his deceased mother. But he attributed the feeling as being created by the brain as a coping mechanism, saying, quote, I didn't think, where did you come from? Because I believed it was a projection of what was happening inside my mind, end quote. And so there you go. That's a very rational thing. And maybe that's some afterthought on it. Like, what really happened there? That couldn't have been mom coming to my rescue. Right. It's an image meant to calm you down, much like Jodie Foster in contact. It's her it's her deceased that's dad, but it's not really your dad, but it's something that's not going to freak her out with tentacles and giant right. uh, bug eyes. Are there any cases where something bad happened? Well, there is one. And here's something fascinating because it's a scary to note, but also fascinating. There may be one only recorded case of a malevolent sensed presence experience, and it comes from the Arctic. Quote, a dog sled racer participating in a long distance race, the Yukon Quest, met a colleague on the trail who invited him to rest for a while in a warm and comfortable hotel room. Exhausted, he entered the hotel and went to bed. The next musher on the trail noticed his abandoned sled and dog team and found him sleeping in the snow and woke him before he died of hypothermia. Wow. Yeah, that's like, please come in. If statistically there are negative things happening, but they're only happening a very small percentage of the time, and we, this is not a very scientific gathering of data mm. because really what we have is a lot of anecdotes, and one of the anecdotes is creepy, and it reminds me of when Richard Haddam was talking right. about the the scary near-death experience. Yeah. Again, statistically, you seem to hear about those less. Again, not a scientific analysis, but... If it comes down to this being internal or external or uh, angels, one cannot imagine why an angel would encourage you to lay down in the snow and die. <laughs> or angel of death, maybe. Why yeah. your mind yeah. internally, if it's generating this holographic person, right. it would seem like that would be a self destructive act if this was an internal. Exactly. Thing. Well, if we um, think about that, in that, what, what's the cause of that? Well, it could be, uh, you know, in the ghost realm, some things are helpful, some things not so helpful. It's like on the astral yeah. plane, there are creatures that are neutral, they're doing their own thing, there are some there to help you, and then there's some that do not have your best interests in mind. And you have to be defensive on that. But just the fact that it was kind of like, uh, well, first of all, the guy's, <laughs> he's in an Arctic race, and yeah. uh, he's got a dog sled team, and he's on the Yukon Quest, and somebody presents in a very dreamlike way, like, come into this hotel, rest a while. There are many cups for you to drink from. You do wonder then if they are successful in luring you to your wintry slumber in the fake hotel, the hallucinatory hotel, you're not allowed to talk about it, right? How many times has that yeah. worked where it did lure somebody to their death, a la the voice, a yeah. la the trickster element? And so uh, this is one case where that, luckily that guy got saved and he lived to tell the tale because it's usually the opposite. The person, as we said before, you're so miserable and in such agony that you're just going to jump over the side of the dinghy in your survival raft. And that voice inside says, no, 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 don't, don't, don't do that yet. You know what? There will be survivors. You're one of them. Just hang in there. This is the opposite. Yeah. You wouldn't hear about the things that are successful. It's kind of like mm. the story of the, the Pugwaji, which yeah. we have been saying <laughs> Pukwaji for all yeah. these years, oh, but yes. uh, our good friend, Allison Jornland sent me a YouTube video mm. of an indigenous person saying it Pugwaji. So I'm correcting that now mm. after all these years, but they, you know, if they successfully lure you away and get yeah. you to jump off a cliff or disappear somewhere, uh, it's not a story that you live to tell. No, but you can come back as a changeling. And then that oh, people say, like, you you're not so-and-so, even the... Oh, speaking of which, the Constellation on Apple TV is weirdly, because I just happened to mm. kind of binge it while we're in the middle of this series, and there are so many concurrent themes with it that it's ridiculous. It's got the third man situation. Oh. It's got, uh, you know, quantum time slippage and all that kind of stuff is happening, too. But there's a painting that features in that mm. uh, series about of a changeling which is uh, oh, interesting, really? which is what reminded me of it. But folks, if you haven't seen it and you like our show, I think you would enjoy the Constellation series on uh, Apple TV. 
Okay, for our final three tales, almost from the crypt, it's noteworthy that while mountains, polar expeditions, and ocean travel seem to generate the most sensed presence experiences, any place with pending danger and privation or weariness can seem to generate a liminal friend, and they can even show up in man-made disasters. So as we mentioned in part one, famous aviator Charles Lindbergh experienced the sense presence during his historic solo flight on uh, May 20th through the 21st, 1927, flying from New York City to Paris, which took him 33 and a half hours at a distance of 3,600 miles, quite uh, groundbreaking at the time. No one else had done that before. Uh, unless you believe that the <laughs> two guys in the White Bird uh, from France succeeded in reaching North right. America, which some people think they did before their plane went down. Well, as you love to say, we're going to have to rewrite all the history books. Yeah, Actually, you, you they were going the said. other way, yeah. but it was prior to uh, Charles Lindbergh, right. uh, the, the, the Oiseau Blanc, the White Bird, the yeah. aircraft was lost and is still missing, although we know some people that think they know where it is. Well, uh, stay there tuned for that, folks. But you're yeah. absolutely right, and I do believe personally that there is a lot that would have to be rewritten about history if we knew what really went on, and that's what keeps me going. Yes. But go. getting back to Lindbergh, what was unusual, I think, with his case, he claimed that these, quote, ghostly presences passed through the walls of his plane when he was getting mm -hmm. weary. Just didn't pop up behind him. They did, They floated right through the, uh, the sheet metal there. It's just odd that that's how he sensed they came into the fuselage. And he didn't see these presences, but was able to converse with them. And, uh, you know, again, when he was getting weary, you try staying up for three, three and a half hours driving a car. It's very dangerous. Don't yeah. do that, folks. Seriously, don't do anything for three, three and a half hours. It's, uh, you're not in your right mind. People could easily write this off as just a uh, tiredness, delirium, this and that. But regardless of what it was, they provided company, conversation, and also navigational advice and reassurance. As we've said before, he seemed to do well enough on his own with navigation, but doesn't hurt to get a little advice, especially from your higher self, perhaps, or whatever it was. Yeah. One thing about the Spirit of St. Louis, by the way, it's at the National Air and Space Museum, oh, yeah, the Smithsonian. Yeah. Definitely worth checking out. But the other thing that's super freaky about it, if you ever look at a picture of the cockpit, is that there's yeah. no front window. There's uh, all there's uh, two side windows yeah. and then just a giant panel in the front. There is no way to look out the front of that aircraft right you can't see straight ahead is what Freaking you're saying crazy yeah. like I, I i don't i don't get it i don't you know well it's, it's also it's, like uh amelia uh, wants to be a pilot so <laughs> well not in that plane no but, but i'm, uh, I'm yeah. just like oh please, but it's also uh kid. yeah it's kind of it's a little odd to me as well uh, when you look at uh, Amelia's Vega, Vega 5, yeah. I think the... Uh, yeah, where that plane's so cool. What I remember is a cantilever design, so the wing yeah. is sandwiched onto the fuselage, and so it's a very tiny front-looking forward window because you're basically yeah. cutting a hole out between the, the fuselage and the, and the top of the plane and the top wing. And so really, you're looking at the side. Yeah, I think there's yeah. something odd about that, right? But eh, yeah, it's come on, strange. you're on the but air. I mean, that's what, like, a lot of times when you look, and I'm sure everybody's done this, when, who's flown, you know, you get in, you peek into the cockpit, the door's yeah. open, they're up there doing the checklist, and you look, and you're like, the windows are pretty tiny at the front. It's well, like the, yeah. the dashboard comes up to the top of your eyebrows. Yeah. It's like, how do they see anything anyway? <laughs> well, <laughs> hey, come on. it's You're you're in the middle of the air. There's not yeah. a whole lot of other stuff going on, you know, except for yeah. geese and other birds, uh, which you hopefully don't strike. But, but another area, an instance where this phenomenon can happen in any geographical area to the extremes, the EUEs, up in the air, in the ocean, on the ocean, down below the ocean, on the high mountain, and in our next story here, in a canyon, on the ground. And this next example is uh, from the paper, and we mentioned it in part one. It's one of my favorite harrowing, ghastly survival stories, just a tremendous story of survival. It's the story of Aaron Ralston's canyoneering climbing ordeal, also brought to the screen in the motion picture 127 hours. I know what happened. I know how he got out of there. But what I did not know, I did not know this connected to Third Man, which I was interested to learn as we did this episode. Well, yeah. And I have not seen the movie. Right. Because sometimes a film like that, I, I get overly empathetic. Like, I don't know. Yes. I don't know if I can take it 
honestly. I didn't know if I could take it. Yes. Yeah. Maybe that's why I, I, it's been on my list for a very long time since it came yeah. out. So 127 Hours is a 2010 biographical film about Aaron's survival based on his 2004 memoir titled Between a Rock and a Hard Place. And there's another reason I should see it and wanted to have seen it. Uh, the film was directed by Danny Boyle, known yeah. for such films as Shallow Grave, Train Spotting, 28 Days Later, Slumdog Millionaire, and many others. And then uh, James Franco stars yes. as Aaron. Yes. Well, I want to briefly summarize his story here because I just found it so as inspirational as it is gruesome. And speaking of gruesome, uh, we're not going to get into too many of the gory details, but he does have to free himself <laughs> as some animals have done when they get caught in a trap. I'm sure you've heard of that uh, trope before. For very young folks or people who are sensitive, just be aware. I don't think maybe you have to stop or skip over this. Like I said, I'm not going to get too grotesque here, but uh, it is what it is, which is why the story is so phenomenal. Well, Aaron's story is that he was solo descending Blue John Canyon in southeastern Utah, Canyonlands National Park, on April 26th, 2003, when he inadvertently caused an 800-pound boulder to dislodge, which pinned his right arm at the wrist under it. And against his better judgment, and I think perhaps because he was overconfident as an experienced climber, we've certainly talked about that before, the extensive experience leading to perhaps a little carelessness because of familiarity mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Aaron hadn't told anyone he was going canyoneering or where he was going, and he had no means to call for help. He knew his chances weren't good unless someone just happened to be climbing the same remote spot. So he spent the next three days sipping the remaining 12 ounces of water from his Nalgene bottle and nibbling on the only food he had, which was either two burritos or half of a veggie burrito. <laughs> I've heard both. On the fifth day, a dehydrated and increasingly delirious Aaron Ralston was losing hope and not expecting to survive the night. He then started to chip out his name, date of birth, and the date he expected he'd die in the sandstone rock. He then videotaped his last goodbyes to his friends and family. It may have been while he was chipping away at this, or maybe the next morning, when I recall him saying in an interview that he, he missed with his multi-tool and he nicked the thumb on the trapped hand and he could hear the built-up gases hiss out. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Well, it was at that point he realized that his arm was decomposing and time was running out. During the evening, he didn't expect to survive. At some point when Aaron was at his lowest and accepted his fate, he said a young boy appeared to him. Yeah, so Forrest, I, I found a uh, copy of his book. I thought it would be interesting to read. This is from page mm -hmm. 248 of his book, Between a Rock and a Hard Place. Color bursts in my mind, and then I walk through the canyon wall on my own this time, stepping into a living room. A blonde three-year-old boy in a red polo shirt comes running across a sunlit hardwood floor, and what I somehow know is my future home. By the same intuitive perception, I know the boy is my own. I bend to scoop him into my left arm, using my handless right arm to balance him, and we laugh together as I swing him up to my shoulder. This interaction is a powerful departure from the previous trances. In the others, I was spellbound and restrained from engaging other people, but now I am actively participating in the action. I'm mobile and free. The boy happily perches on my right shoulder, holding my arms in his little hands while I steady him with my left hand and right stump. Smiling, I prance about the room, tiptoeing in and out of the sun dapples on the oak floor, and he giggles gleefully as we twirl together. Then, with a shock, the vision blinks out. I'm back in the canyon, echoes of his joyful sounds resonating in my mind, creating a subconscious reassurance that somehow I will survive this entrapment. Despite having already come to accept that I will die where I stand before help arrives, now I believe I will live. That belief, that boy, changes everything for me. Wow. While this manifestation could have been brought on by delirium, of course, Aaron not only saw the boy he took to be his future son, but said he could lift him on his shoulders. I know it probably sounds like just, you know, you're, you're starting to hallucinate and, and daydream, and it's maybe like a lucid dream. In this case, though, it seemed maybe like more of a projection in front of his eyes, like a living vision you were stepping into. That's kind of how I took it to be. Yeah. And that's how I took, he said, for him to say, like, it's not really just a vision. I could lift the boy on my shoulders, and I felt it. And 
in this experience, he envisioned himself playing uh, with his boy sometime in the future and with his missing arm to note <laughs> this third man or, or maybe first or second boy, this gave him the will to live. We in? Is it going? Uh, yeah, I don't, I think so. I think the, I don't know how long this feed's going to hold, but I think we're in. We hacked the feed. We just, <laughs> turns out. Okay, great. We should get started then. Scared all the time. It's a podcast about things that scare us. Whoa, what are you doing? I'm making a trailer. They asked for a trailer, like, got my trailer music, doing my trailer voice. No, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's false advertising. We're just a couple of idiots talking about things that scare us. This kind of seems like overkill. Maybe you should go for something spookier, like something scary. Okay, fine. Scared All the Time is a podcast about things that scare us. No, that's too scary. Okay, well, I only have one more piece of music. This will have to do. I'm Chris Kalari. And I'm Ed Vicola. And every week, we're going to take a look at something new that scares us and why. Uh, like this trailer going over a minute. Yeah, they said we definitely should not do that. Join us for season one of Scared All the Time. A brand new show from Astonishing Legends. Available anywhere you listen to podcasts. Hey, Richard Haddam here. You've probably heard me on Astonishing Legends, but now I have a podcast of my own, Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf, where I talk about all the books I love, the stories behind them, and how they made me who I am. The first time I read the Amityville Horror, I felt like I knew the Lutz family. George brooding and moody, Kathy paranoid and somehow guilty, the boys fighting like savages... Missy hanging out with a ghost pig named Jody. Maybe that's the part I identified with the most. Not the pig. The feeling that they were all losing their minds. That's when I learned there are basically six stages in the life of every parapsychologist. Curiosity, investigation, doubt, acceptance, James Randi, and depression. A hole opened up in the wall of his apartment and an insect-like being, the size of a tall man, but in the form of an enormous praying mantis, stepped through. Odd, even for New York. We're leaving the highway now. Have you noticed the paved off-ramp we took has turned to a gravel path, and now a dirt road, and now nothing at all? Have you noticed how quickly the sun sets here? It's too late to turn back now. Everything's closed for the night. Why not sit down? I'll light a fire. There's a story I need to tell you. I'm inviting you all to join me on Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf. Come for the books. Stay for the frankly surprising amount of oversharing. Forrest and Scott thank you for supporting their sponsors. I'm Julia Covington. Now, back to the show. Well, I wanted to mention, I don't remember that anecdote. I think maybe it's probably one that he was not ready to tell in most interviews, perhaps, closer to the time that this happened. Yeah, I don't remember that either. When he was doing the news circuit and everything, I don't particularly remember that, right. you know, because I didn't go very far down the yeah. rabbit hole on his story, but I remember him being on the Today Show and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't remember him talking about that. Well, for the reasons we said. I mean, people might have said like, oh, that's too bad, you were hallucinating. And uh, it's easier not to say that or keep it more personal or save it, I guess, for the book or a memoir when you feel more comfortable with it. One thing I think our listeners will notice is there's a pattern here. We're seeing a pattern yeah. with all these stories going back to Shackleton. I mean, you can't necessarily say that about Slocum when he was sailing around mm -hmm. the world. He put it right in his book in 1900. But a lot right. of these other stories, the Shackleton story was not in the first draft mm -hmm. of South, his book. And uh, the other cases of this, they don't necessarily tell those stories when they first recount what they yeah. went through, right. which is interesting for a variety of reasons that also might connect to that phrase that we often bring up, paranormal apathy. But in mm -hmm. addition to that, there's kind of a strange blind spot or camouflage yeah. that goes over these kinds of events when they happen to you. Right. You have to really think about them to bring them back. But then the other thing is, oh, you know, I don't want people to think I'm crazy. Yeah. You know, or just say I was hallucinating. But right. to Ralston's credit, he points it out and he makes it very clear that it was a poignant moment for him. It's incredibly intimate and personal. What else is there other than like that is at your moment, your most desperate point, and this happens, and it's easy for people to write that off or maybe even make fun of you for it. But 
I think it, maybe at some point you don't care what other people think. Like that's what I know. That's what happened. But the anecdote I did remember because it stuck with me is also uh, not as perhaps sensational or fantastical, but very poignant and almost mythological. And so I like to tell this as well. You got to realize he's in a canyon, slot canyon, and he has a narrow view of the sky. Right. And so uh, during that day, you know, after the first night, I think starting with the next day, what he remembers, imagine also the boredom and just going over in your mind, like, how did I get here? Man, I should have told somebody where I was going. Oh my God. You know, how long is it going to take them for them to figure out that I'm missing? All these things, nothing there, not even food or water much. You're just alone with your thoughts and your regrets and just going over everything in your mind. And, you know, it's a very barren place as well. Not many people hiking it. So his view of the sky, though, at a specific time during the day, this bird flew over, this big bird. And I can't remember if he said it was like a raven or a hawk, something of that size, just significant to make you pay attention. That's pretty much the only thing he saw all day, I think, just that hawk flying over his slot of the canyon. And then the next day, around the same time, the same bird or another bird flew over the same pattern the same way. And it happened again the next day. And then the day after that, and I believe it was on the fifth or sixth day, he didn't see the bird. And that's when he knew, that's my sign. If I'm going to do anything, if I'm going to get out of here, I've got to go now. I've got to do this now. It just kind of yeah. gives me shivers. Just like that was his sign that the last day, like, I'm not coming back, man. So right. You've got to get yourself out of this if you want. So at that point, he knew he had to take extreme measures if he was going to survive. Aaron was then struck with the idea that with his knowledge of mechanical engineering and using leverage, he could break the bones in his arm using torque against the boulder as the dull knife and pliers wouldn't be able to get the job done alone. He fashioned the tubing tourniquet and proceeded with the operation, leaving the major arteries for last, with the whole thing taking about an hour to complete. And I remember him saying the worst part was severing the major nerves, which run through the bones, I believe. He said, oh, uh, yeah, he said, God. because the rest of the arm's kind of dead, you're not feeling it so yeah. much. He said, well, this is not too bad. I mean, it's still horribly painful, but it was then when you hear a, a twang. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, he said that made you see stars. Well, then Aaron fashioned a sling for the arm and then he had to repel 65 feet or 20 meters down the sheer canyon wall. And then once he got past that, his car was eight miles away, and there was no phone in that either. But by sheer luck or chance, after a little over six miles of hiking out of the canyon, Aaron happened upon a family of three who were vacationing from the Netherlands. Eric and Monique Meyer and their son Andy were, of course, shocked to see this sight trudging towards them, but they gave Aaron food and water and rushed to notify the authorities. And by this point, Aaron had lost a quarter of his blood volume and 40 pounds overall. It was about four hours after amputating his arm that Aaron was picked up by helicopter in a wider area of the canyon. And they were coordinating now with the family who was reporting him missing. So they, they narrowed down the area. And he said later that his fear was that he'd have bled to death if he'd severed his arm any earlier. And if he hadn't, he would have been found dead, still pinned days later. So whenever that hawk came over, that was the sign. That was the time to do it. You can take that as a sign from above or not. I don't when know. I was but. looking through his book. He also mentioned that how he felt kind of guilty mm. about the vision he was presenting to the Myers poor young son. You know, he comes <laughs> walking up, his arms yeah. missing. He's it's... like a mess. And he was like, he basically gave thought to like, the lasting impression oh. that that young man would probably have. You know, people take those kind of things differently. Uh, maybe it inspired him. It uh, Maybe it grossed him out. Uh, maybe he'd become a doctor one day. <laughs> yeah. Well, after this incredible trial of will and endurance, Aaron Lee Ralston worked as a mechanical engineer and became a motivational speaker and continued his passion for climbing, becoming the first person to scale all of Colorado's 14ers solo in winter. In Western U.S. mountain climbing terms, a 14er is a mountain peak with an elevation of at least 14,000 feet, and there are 53 14ers in the state of Colorado. You, sir, have spent a lot of time in Colorado. Have you ever climbed a 14er? No, I have not. <laughs> Me neither. So there's the book, Between a Rock and a Hard Place, came out in 2004, a must-read. Well, now the paper features two uh, remaining stories, actually one more, and this one's significant in that it includes a... Third man, sense present scenario, but with a man-made 
scenario. This took place on September 11th, 2001, or 9-11, as we say here, and involves uh, the case of Will Jimeno, a New York Port Authority police officer who got buried in the concourse level of the World Trade Center just when the first of the Twin Towers collapsed. The first story that's presented in the uh, John Geiger book is also pretty harrowing and, and quite a story of survival, also taking place in uh, the Twin Towers. But I believe this was a, uh, a gentleman in the financial arena, and of course, uh, sadly, most of his uh, company was lost. But that story involves him making his way down. They told people, it's okay to go back to your offices. Well, he started to make his way down, and then he was met by some other people who were coming on their way up, and they said, no, 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 you can't go down anymore. It's unpassable. You know, they were just clean to the floor, black choking smoke, heat, flames. So they were all trying to make their way back. But at some point, there was another figure who convinced him to, no, no, we got to get down. I know there's fire or whatever, but we can bust through this wall. And it had to do with where the elevator blocks were that this was saved, this location, because of the massive elevator shaft, as you can imagine, for that building. So it was, it was more reinforced than the stairwell they were at. And uh, this savior, he took his advice, and uh, he and I believe a few other people made their way out. Yeah, you're talking about Ron DeFrancesco That's in right. this yes. case. He yes. was one of only four people that made it out from above the 81st floor, Ooh, yeah, which I was can... the center of impact for uh, Flight 175. So. That's right. Uh, yeah. Unbelievable. Uh, well, Will Jimeno, 10 hours into his ordeal, uh, he was in pretty bad shape. He uh, was injured. He was dehydrated. And that's when he became aware of a very powerful presence that was with him. Quote, I looked up and I saw Jesus coming toward me. He was carrying a bottle of clear, cold water. That moment, I knew we were going to make it out. End quote. Boy, Rich would have a, a field day yeah. with that. He loves it when <laughs> Jesus appears in stories. Uh, as with Orfeo Angelucci. Uh, go listen yes. to that one. Well, there you go. That lifted his spirits, as it should. And he felt he was going to survive. And uh, he was. He was found alive in the rubble. So... That's another good example because sometimes it is a religious figure, as we said. Sometimes a, a relative, sometimes a, a nobody you don't know. Somebody, it's just a voice that's reassuring. Most always, uh, though, s somebody comforting. Well, now we're going to start heading towards what's going on here section, the theories. This reminds me of one of my favorite uh, mm -hmm. Keenan sketches from Saturday Night Live. What's up with that? <laughs> or what's up with that? <laughs> and that was the, the punchline. <laughs> Yeah. Well, back to that. Uh, remember I mentioned in part one, I believe, the uh, article from Medium, the blog yes. uh, website. Yes, we did talk about it a little this bit. This yeah. offers a little bit of fascinating insight because now we're, you know, I, I'm sure most people are thinking like, well, it's just a factor of your mind producing this. And maybe it is. Yeah. And this has to deal though, like how do we view this and the people that experience this kind of thing versus people we tend to think of as mentally ill? Is that what's happening here? Is it a form of that? And the article is titled, How Does Our Understanding of the Sense Presence Phenomenon in Extreme Settings Change the Way We Talk About So-Called Mental Illnesses in Daily Life? This is by Blaze Cottingham from May 15, 2020. Blaze goes on to point out the four facts or, or consistencies in these stories. Number one, they usually occur in mentally and physically healthy individuals. And again, this is from uh, the... The paper by Sudfeld and Geiger, and Geiger being one of the co-authors of The Third Man Factor the book. Yes, indeed. And factor number two, they arise in times of stress. Number three, they are considered a coping resource that contributes to survival. Number four, while there exist many theories, the source remains unknown. So keep that in mind. I always like to remind people, sometimes there is no settled upon answer. And yes, <laughs> ours, right. yours, with whatever's <laughs> is not the right one. We just have to get it sorted through and go with one we, we think is, but probably try not to insist that you have the right one. Well, as we continue on with that article, here are some uh, interesting summations I made. And as we approach the theory section here, let's revisit the article we mentioned. Uh, very few of the perceivers had mental health issues of the cases that, we've, uh, that are known. Uh, these experiences are healthy. They're highly functioning individuals under extreme stress in these extreme environments. The sensed presence experiences are viewed by both perceiver and theorists as positive and functional for survival. And as Blaze Cottingham's, and as Blaze Cottingham's article suggests, this is in stark contrast to how society views hallucinations or schizophrenia. 
Keep that in mind, folks. Right. When somebody tells you like, oh, I had a hallucination. Like, oh, okay. All right. Oh, that's too bad. They attribute it to a mental illness. Well, the dominant medical model in the field of psychiatry, quote, makes a distinction between the presence and absence of psychotic symptoms, advocating that hallucinations are qualitatively different to, uh, internal quote, normal, and uh, internal quote, experiences, end quote. So the article goes on to posit that if sense presences are commonplace in healthy populations, it's now questionable to make a categorical difference between what's normal and abnormal. And if you reject that polarized view, then you might look to what's called a continuum model, psychology. I'm sure our students of psychology out there and practicing professionals uh, know what that is. I will continue on here, which, which just basically simply views unusual experiences as a response to stress. So there you go. It's a way of defining this without like, you're, okay, you're either healthy or you're crazy. And if you see stuff, you're crazy. Right. Very right. crude terms, I'm sorry. But uh, right. that's basically what they're saying here. So referring to researchers, Peters and colleagues, they say it's not the number of psychotic episodes that differ between people with and without schizophrenia, but the level of distress. So in support of these continuum models, it might explain why a sensed presence experience for some people are just a functional coping mechanism, while for others, it might be associated with debilitative mental illnesses. Distress is subjective, and stress can lead to dysfunction. However, in the context of extremes, stress can also be eustress, which, according to Merriam-Webster, I had to look this up just to be sure again, is, quote, a positive form of stress having a beneficial effect on, on health, motivation, performance, and emotional well-being. It's, it's kind of like when you get stressed out about a, a promotion or a vacation, maybe. Or maybe your stress leads you to studying more for your pending exam. Well, there you go, and you do well. Well, that's funny you mentioned that. I don't think we mentioned it before, but it's in the uh, dedication or prologue. I think it's a friend of John Geiger's, but it's Vincent Lamb, and he has his own Wikipedia entry, but he has a, a story of his own, which is also, I think, worth mentioning now that you brought it up because it's not a mountain climbing story. He was studying for his medical exams, I think, to get into medical school. So hugely stressful time for him and just cramming his head. And he, he was doubtful. He didn't think he was going to do it. He wasn't, he wasn't eating or sleeping very much, just studying constantly and thinking he wasn't doing very well. It was kind of like adventure medicine, I think was his emphasis as well, late, later on anyway. But he said he was just beside himself. Like he's just like, ah, I can't just hitting his head against a, a brick wall of books. And and then he, I think what the deal was is he was taking a shower and he just had kind of this epiphany where this voice came to him and said like, okay, calm down, dude. You're, you got this. Yeah. You're going to be okay. Yeah. You're going to be okay. But yeah. this is what you're going to do. Okay. Stop wasting your time with the other stuff. Focus on this book or that or whatever. It had a game plan for him, this voice. Right. It was like a waking vision moment where just like, okay, you're going to be fine, but you're spinning your wheels here. So go do this and you're still going to have to study, of course, but do this and you'll be fine. And he was. Write down these 10 commandments. <laughs> just <laughs> stop uh, cramming Netflix. Yeah. No, whatever it was, it was just, again, it was the, uh, the advice that you needed. And he probably knew that himself, but he was so up in his own mind, he could not think straight. And so... I mean, it's also a lot of bad stress that comes with it because uh, you're you're probably over worrying into uh, to quote uh, it's like it's hard it's it's kind of a, a Zen koan I think Ricky J from the movie The Spanish Prisoner I'll get this oh, point. yeah yeah so it's one of my favorite uh, uh, Mamet uh, lines here but he says uh, worry is interest paid in advance on a debt that never comes due yeah so think about that folks well to go on to sum up the article here. Yeah, it can be, uh, it can lead to a positive outcome. Like I said, it's a very stressful, uh, unhealthy environment being uh, that close to uh, your your demise. But the positive outcome is you lived. It gave you the will to survive. And whether stress is harmful or helpful depends on how one views the source of the stress. So the article's conclusion here, how might this work here continue to shape society and human behavior and health in the future? which I think is a fascinating way, using this example of the sensed presence with mentally healthy people, considerably, with mentally unhealthy people, and how we should think about that, and stigma, and all that, and uh, clinical study. Well, in light of understandings of the sensed presence phenomenon, there is an opportunity to reform the way that we talk about mental health. This is now quoting from the article. The benefits of shifting from a categorical medical model that views people as either mentally ill or mentally healthy to continuum models, which advocate that unusual experiences are normal responses to stress, is twofold. 
Firstly, it promotes the consideration of appraisal mediating the relationship between unusual experiences and their outcome, leading to more effective interventions. And secondly, since stigmatization often results in uh, from seeing people as fundamentally different, it's suggesting that people with mental health issues lie on a continuum with those functioning highly enough to travel across Antarctica would contribute greatly to reducing discrimination faced by those in distress. You know, how do we look at people who do have these kinds of experiences in the ones that have bona fide mental illness, schizophrenia, to people who are, they're totally healthy in most every way, except that they were in an unusual and extreme environment and were tremendously stressed. We don't really look down on them. We we look upon them as adventurous and brave and exciting. But then again, to your point, Scott, earlier here to tie this all together, is that uh, that's why they don't often probably tell these stories, that they don't want to seem mentally ill. So just a right. viewpoint about how we should look at this. All right, now let's formally launch into theoretical explanations from the Peter Sudfeld and John Geiger paper. Back to that. Well, the authors start uh, the section off with the observation that there are many explanations for the sensed presence phenomenon, but this is paradoxical because there is so little systematic research on the subject. You know what I'm saying here? It's like yes. a lot of people have ideas. No one's really t- studied it efficiently. Or, right, which, by we the know, way, yeah. is, is something that we encounter frequently on Astonishing Legends. Everybody's yeah. got an opinion. No one's really looked into it because I yeah. think it's not, and this is different, I'll say, just to be fair. It's just that you don't have a lot of data. I think it's fascinating to a lot of researchers, but it's just not an area that people have studied. Then you wonder why, like, no one has studied this. this is so fascinating. Well, Geiger and Sudfeld go on to pause it. You might have a lot of theories because of the dramatic life and death context of these cases and how far these are from average or mundane paths of experimental and clinical psychology, which gets theorists interested because it is so outside the norm, is what they say, than most, most people have. So the authors note that the theories range from the mystical to the psychodynamic to the situational and the neurological. Sudfeld and Geiger, from their research, posit that maybe the simplest and most direct explanation is that the sensed presence is not an illusion. It's genuine. There really is an entity next to the person experiencing the phenomenon. What do you think about that? Wow, I think we're starting out with the fringe here. I thought we did the fringe last. Before you jump to the woo and think that, uh, oh, Sudfeld and Geiger, they're those kind of researchers. I get it. Okay. (laughs) All right. Before you think that, they do want to knock this first one down. Now, yeah. uh, I'm going to come back to it and our personal things because uh, I like this passage here. Will you, won't you read this for us? All right. Yeah, this is a pretty fascinating little bit here. So perhaps the simplest, and I'm quoting now, perhaps the simplest and most direct explanation is that sensation of a presence is veridical. The sensed entity is actually there. One of the authors at the end of a presentation about the phenomenon was challenged by a member of the audience who described herself as one of a large group of people whose astral bodies responded to emergencies around the world, helping those in dire need. I wonder if she has a pager. In a recent book, (laughs) Emma Heathcote James collected stories about sensed presences that were interpreted as guardian angels who saved their beneficiaries Mm -hmm. from a variety of disasters and misfortunes. Heathcote James leaves open the question as to whether these angels are real, but does admit the possibility that, quote, other realities, end quote, exist. Our answer to angels and traveling astral bodies is the same as that made to the woman whose astral body participated in rescue activities. This is a level of explanation outside the realm of science and therefore outside our considerations. I think that's fair. I like that they are pointing that out themselves here, and that Geiger is saying that, because in some of the skeptical rebuttals that you'll find to the third man factor or uh, syndrome, the explanations for it will suggest that Geiger is not a serious person when it comes to researching this kind of stuff. But right here, he is saying, this is outside science, and we're not going to think about it right now. It's a silly place. Let's not go there. I will say for myself, though, for an example of uh, synchro mysticism, this is probably within the last four months, the 12th or 15th or 20th time I've heard astral projection. 
Yeah. It's starting to freak me out. Uh, maybe I should <laughs> sign up for a volunteer search and rescue astral team. Yeah, well, that'd be good. Got to learn how to project first before I can start rescuing people. Hey, if you could do but, that, uh, you know, that's kind of cool. And you're, you know, you're back in your body and your comfy bed and home and chair before, uh, you know, without getting too cold or dirty. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you can help people out. If that's true, if that, uh, like, that's pretty cool. And maybe that is part of it. But also in certain instances, who knows how these machinations, uh, machinations work, but especially when it comes to having specific expert knowledge about something technical, uh, how to sail, how to, <laughs> how to mountain climb, this and that, maybe they get a person who's, uh, experienced with that. Or maybe it's just, they're like, Hey, I'll hold your hand psychically, right. astrally while you go through this, keep going. You're going to be fine. Anyway, a fascinating thing to talk about and a, a weird thing to hear at a seminar. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but kind of fun too. Jazzes things yes. up. Well, as we stated earlier, few, if any, of uh, the perceivers are schizophrenic or mentally disturbed. Most cases don't involve a fever, and most experiencers are awake at the time. The relatively short duration of time of the experience also argues against mental illness. It just doesn't last long enough to justify a schizophrenia or other psychosis diagnosis. It's not just going to be, oh, this is the, yeah, this is convenient this, in this one moment. Right. I don't think yeah. it's temporary insanity. So as the paper says, you know, explanations based on psychotic or feverish hallucinations, dreams, hypnagogic imagery, they miss some of the crucial aspects of the EUE sensed presence phenomenon. And again, we find that a lot with a lot of explanations, whether it's owls, hillbillies, whatever, what have you. It doesn't cover everything. My favorite uh, old chestnut, infrasound. Just yeah, avalanches. Stop, folks. Just stop with the avalanches, please. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just teasing. Yeah, it just doesn't cover or answer everything. Well, what about this? That's a Dyatlov Pass <laughs> reference for those of you who are not long timers. I know. We like just want to put this to bed, I guess. No, no shade on anybody here. The need for cognitive closure. Look, there are other things that maybe make more sense. And if you put them all together, it may explain a lot more, but just doesn't ever cover anything. As we go through here, we're going to get back to that, believe it or not, because I didn't also didn't realize this until I started reading more about this. There are more connections to things we've covered in the past. And this is a cousin to maybe some of the other experiences. As much as you will need to separate this in the academic world to be taken seriously and to have this studied, but as we'll see here in a little bit, some of these aspects have been studied. Post-traumatic stress, there is an advantage for the concepts involving traumatic or post-traumatic stress in that the conditions for the third man are highly stressful. <laughs> the stress is in the word and the action. But even when they're not exactly traumatic, though, as with Charles Lindbergh's flight, it wasn't especially traumatic. It's exhausting. Yeah. It's tedious. You know, he needs his wits about him, but not exactly trauma. He He's flown a lot. He, he knows right. how this goes. Right. Right. But again, it's not clear how the mechanism works for a stressful situation to turn into a sensed presence experience. And there really isn't a good explanation for why some people in EUEs have the experience and maybe most people in similar situations do not. Extreme and unusual environments. I just want to remind people what the EUE is. E the yeah. UEs, UEs. But also these trauma concepts don't address how helpful the sensed presences were. Right. How did it know to do this? That's not some information. Or how did it know to take the wheel and sail all night? Well, yeah, we're not going to talk about that. It's a little too freaky. Well, here's another theory you could say, or that, uh, or causal kind of connection here. It's that stimulus monotony or stimulus reduction. You're yes, in a quiet I read about this. Right. Yeah. Read this on a website for uh, the movie Unbreakable. And a guy on a you know, hundred mile marathon through the Arctic uh, tundra had to uh, remove his own leg that was trapped with a sharp piece of slate. Ugh. But he made it. I think he. I think he lived. But it's in that same kind of environment and stress level. No mention of uh, that that person saw anything or was helped. But the story I was going to relate is that another friend who uh, is into kind of outdoor adventure kind of things was talking about this guy who is a like a hundred mile marathoner in Arctic conditions, and he practices. He trains with his treadmill pointed at a corner, a white corner of uh, the walls of his uh, basement or whatever, just white walls. And they said, well, why don't you watch some fun TV or look at a video? And he's like, no, no, I want the conditions to be exactly what I'm seeing in the race, which is total whiteout. <laughs> just like, yeah. and so yeah. that's how he gets into his head, you know, and prepare himself mentally 
for what he's going to do. But that's a monotony stimulus uh, environment here, stimulus reduction. Yes. So, well, this idea involves uh, the concept or, or idea or theory that human beings evolved for and through their life experiences become, you become accustomed to a normal range of stimulus input and that amount of variety. Everyday life, you're used to this kind of level of uh, the same kind of sounds, sights, smells, tastes, this and that. You know, admittedly, of course, this range, is, it's pretty wide, but whenever the level of this input is either way below that normal zone or way above it, this optimal zone area here, the information processing system takes steps to get it back into that normal, accustomed, comfortable range. I wonder if that's part of the impetus for pareidolia. Like, because could be. when you yeah. look at the cloud or you look right. at the image and the reflection or the smear on the ground and you see the face, it's maybe it's it has to do with that. I, your mind wanting to get back to things that it recognizes, you know, and that, of course, would be. Yes, you're back. Jumbled. Right. You're back yeah. to pattern recognition, whereas we need to make sense of stuff. We need to figure stuff out for our own safety. When yeah. it goes off the rails is when you have that that phobia where you see uh, patterns uh, like you can't look at sunflower seeds in a sunflower. Right. Right. Patterns like that, holes, small, tiny holes will upset you. And I can't remember the name of it. We've talked about that. We before. have talked about yeah. it. Yeah. But with the sunflowers, those, and I think we just mentioned this or may have, but those are fractals. Right. Which I could see where that could be overstimulating in a way. Well, th that's kind of the same thing is that your, your brain is trying to um, develop a strategy to clunk it, chunk it, group it together into fewer units, or you want to mask it some way if there's too much. So it's like you're trying to, your brain's trying to level that out. That amount of stimulus input is too much for you to handle. If there's too little of it, then it will generate some stimulus. Got to clunk it and chunk it. Clunk it and chunk it. And, and so what happens is that you'll then try through physical or mental strategies, you uh, will try to lift the level of stimulus. Again, talking about hearing Van Halen too on the sailboat. This is what it's talking about is that that phenomenon is your brain trying to make something up to get it to that level where you weren't on the sailboat for a week, not hearing anything. <laughs> so in the former here in the paper says that, you know, the individual, the person, they might start singing, humming, uh, whistling, or talking aloud to themselves. You want to increase that visual stimulation too by uh, like a rapid visual search. Or if you're in the dark, you'll press your finger against your eyelid, right? To get the retinal firing and, and cause some like light flashes. Oh, you ever yeah. done that? Yeah. You want to get some input in, or you increase the tactile stimulation, perhaps through exercise. You see this a lot, people biting their fingernails, stimulating the skin, and so on, tapping, this kind of thing. So to increase stimulation mentally, you might start to do a memory search, start thinking about something that, uh, you know, like a puzzle or a mental problem, something to solve, or you make detailed plans for the future. You start thinking about stuff, or you just kind of let yourself lapse into flights of imagination fancy. Right. And this is where the value of meditation comes in is in removing yeah. all of the stimulation and being okay with it being removed. Exactly. What you want to achieve for a little moment here, 10 minutes is all it takes every day is equanimity, even flow. Just let it pass through. Thoughts come, you don't bury them and suppress them. You just let them float on by. So the theory is that when your mind is doing all this work, mm -hmm. maybe it's creating the sensed presence, the unseen companion. Yeah, that's kind of what they're putting that at. person together. Right. It's assembling that person for you. But even when the subject is in a greatly restricted environmental stimulation situation, right. being in a laboratory, right, right. you can have various degrees of image complexity and different sensory modalities. The images are rarely, <laughs> if yeah. ever experienced, as prolonged impressions of someone or something apart from themselves. Actually, they're usually quite fleeting, and right. the subject realizes that they made the sensations or the images. Okay, you know what's going on here, right? People, before they validate something, they want it to be recreated in the lab. That's what it is. Well, if it's right. a real thing, right. then like ghosts, you should be able to recreate that sensation in the lab. Well, people have tried. And we've talked about that actually just, a long time working. ago. In a lab, that's the idea. You can manipulate the dials, so to speak, of the complexity of, of the images that you you give to somebody or test them on. You have control over everything. And then you can have different sensory modalities, meaning that you can show them different images in, in certain fashions. It could be, you know, whatever you want to do in your experiment. Right. Right. And even when that happens, what the, uh, the passage here in the paper says, the images are rarely, if ever, experienced as somebody thinking, okay, I just thought or created something that is outside of my body sitting here next to me 
And this is something that's really apart from me, different. Right. This is a separate thing. You didn't create a tulpa sitting there. But to be fair, it's probably pretty hard to simulate delirium and exhaustion and extreme weather. That's you know. also the point. It is very hard without putting somebody in real danger. So you don't really, it can't really be studied and you can't then label those other studies as the cause for this. Right. And that's also why, as we said at the top of the section, why it's probably not been studied so much. The other thing about this is that there's no documented examples of any of these kinds of images giving any kind of help or instruction to the experiencer. Whereas yeah. you might see something or sense something, but it's not like they talk to you and tell you what to do. It's kind of like when people have the white light experience and it's like, well, there you go. That's just triggered by a, a small electrical voltage to the temporal parietal junction. And uh, no, there's another aspect that takes place after the white light. That can't be created because if that's happening, you're probably dead. This is Jeff Goff. Thank you for listening to Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. Well, now, if you get to the neurological theories, these come in a variety of interesting forms, as the paper says. The, the most straightforward is extreme stress combined with a reduced stimulus, you know, a blank slate, a white out mountain. These cause the normally dominant left cortical hemisphere to become less dominant. What happens when that, when that occurs, it reduces the preponderance of logical linear or reality oriented thinking. The right hemisphere, to put it simplistically, it governs creative, imaginative, nonlinear cognition, and it assumes a greater role than usual. Now that you have a deprivation here, the half of the brain that usually doesn't do this job is stepping in. Right. And what occurs from that, it may include the perception of an imagined other, which enters into your consciousness. So REST, restricted environmental stimulation, much like your deprivation tank kind of thing that we talked about earlier. Sure. These experiments have supported the hypothesis of a shift in hemispheric dominance. Uh, Sudfeld wrote about that in 1994. But then again, as previously discussed, these sense presences do not appear in the laboratory. And it might be that prolonged levels of high stress, which are contraindicated by the very relaxing laboratory environment, as you might imagine, it's not that stressful. You're just in a lab. Yeah. yeah. That's a necessary component for it to trigger. They're thinking that uh, maybe the one hemisphere of the brain takes over and it usually doesn't do this job. So they're just going to create some help. <laughs> here's right, a, right. Here's something to look at. All right. Now to pay off what you talked about before about the God helmet. Remember we talked about uh, yes. we talked about that and electrical stimulation. Michael Persinger had a theory about hemispheric shift. People when they're experiencing a seizure or some kind of brain event like that, the two systems operate in a disjunctive way. So when that happens, the left hemisphere may interpret signals as another person or an out of body experience. Right. or a near-death experience, or an angel, God, or other religious visions, or what we're talking about here, a sensed presence. So here you go, tying it all together, yeah. the out-of-body experience, the near-death experience, uh, seeing a religious figure. This section goes on to say, you know, that kind of anomalous experience occurs uh, by specific circumstances and the individual's culturally derived and personal belief systems. That's also important. We talked about that with Rich with the near death is that people experience something akin to what they would imagine, right? From their culture right. and, and training and what kind of person they are. So according to Persinger is that uh, you can use an electromagnetic currents, whether they're induced or naturally stimulated, and you can alter the firing of the brain, that organ there. So, and when that happens, the hemispheric dominance changes, as we just said, and it leads to unusual and unexplained experiences, including that sensed presence. And these changes can occur in excessively stimulating environments and uh, those with greater than uh, usual repressed stimulation. So here's something that's interesting I, I found uh, as, as a, a sentence here. Experimentally stimulating the temporal lobes of the brain with magnetic field generated in what he calls a God helmet, Persinger reported that many subjects sensed an ethereal presence in the room. Now we've talked about that many times. And so, yeah, you can stimulate it electronically, but Persinger, unlike many theorists in the field here, he acknowledges that uh, every individual is different in their susceptibility to this phenomenon. And that some people, it happens with some people and some people not. 
Now, uh, what else have we talked about? Shadow people. Remember that one? Yeah. Way yeah. back when, when we talked about people saying like, well, you know, I take too much Sudafed or you, you uh, jam a probe in your brain, you can create the, uh, the shadow person feeling. Well, yes, sometimes when your brain is stimulated with a mild electric current, you can get unusual phenomenon. And remember in that one experiment we talked about in the uh, shadow person episode, a woman was sensing that uh, there was someone behind her interfering with her, lying beneath or on her bed and hugging her. Uh, most importantly, the sensation disappeared when the current was turned off and reappeared when it was turned back on again. Right. You're causing that to happen. It's not happening spontaneously out in nature. This, of course, is evidence of a causal link that can be attained only in a laboratory. It doesn't check off all the boxes of the sensed presence experience as we've been describing, but in some instances, the third man or person did move in conformity with the subject's movements, right? The woman said, like, it seemed like it was following me. It was mirroring me. It was doing what I was doing. So that can be stimulated, but that's not what we're talking about with these people here. So a, uh, another side theory that came from uh, looking into this with that angle, it does support Persinger's hypotheses the integrity of one's body image, meaning how you visualize yourself or your, your sensed being. Remember in the Matrix, you had a residual body image? Yes. If you notice yeah. your hair is different, your clothes are different. Right, right. That's your kind of residual self image. That can be messed with when you apply an electric current and stimulate the multisensory integrative regions of the brain. The question is, as the paper goes on, as to whether this is what happens in non-laboratory sensed presence or other anomalous experiences still remains open, however. <laughs> One of the big theories, the bicameral mind theory, and I'll just read the wiki explanation for this. The bicameral mentality is a hypothesis introduced by Julian Jaynes, who argued human ancestors as late as the ancient Greeks did not consider emotions and desires as stemming from their own minds, but as the consequences of actions of gods external to themselves, the theory posits that the human mind once operated in a state which cognitive functions were divided between one part of the brain, which appears to be speaking, and a second part, which listens and obeys, a bicameral mind, and that the breakdown of this division gave rise to consciousness in humans. Man, that's fascinating here. Uh, the, the term was coined by James, who presented the idea in his 1976 book, The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind, wherein he made the case that a bicameral mentality was the normal and ubiquitous state of the human mind as recently as 3,000 years ago, near the end of the Mediterranean Bronze Age. Do you know what he's implying here? That that's how people thought back then. There's one part that makes the suggestions, the other part just does the duty. That plays into so many things. I mean... It plays into what we're taught to try and control mm -hmm. when we're practicing remote viewing. Yep. You're dealing with two different parts yes. yeah, of your mind. Mm -hmm. It also plays into these old ideas. You know, I have, I think I've talked, I haven't talked about this in a while, but um, for p folks that know of the um, Tashin Publishing Company, T A S C H E N, right. right. make these amazing, like very detailed books, coffee table books that are really expensive and yeah. they had a store in Beverly Hills. I don't know if they still do. That was a really cool place. But one of the books that I have, one of the Tashin books that I have is a collection of uh, magic posters. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. like a $300 book. It's huge. And it's all these just magic posters from throughout history. And one of the things that you always see in a, a lot of these magicians posters is the little devils on mm -hmm. the shoulder that are supposedly whispering the secrets to the magic tricks. But we all know that idea of this little, of the good and the bad, and they're on your shoulders telling you to do the thing and don't do that thing. And if you watch TV from the 50s and 60s, there's a references to that in animation and sitcoms and other things. It's like, well, you know, when you hear people say, oh, this little devil told me to do this, and the, that all of that seems like it could be rooted in yeah. this idea, the bicameral mentality and, and the possibility of that. And I guess the other thing that's interesting about what you were saying from the paper earlier, too, is I think about almost like a visual effect that you see in movies when people have these out-of-body experiences mm -hmm. where they're like, they expand out into multiple visions of themselves yeah. and then all snap back together yeah. suddenly. Yeah. You've seen it in a million movies. Yeah, you know, that's you also the in, astral self. Yeah, the astral self, you're like popping out and then popping back together. 
And that is interesting too, because, you know, we've talked about the um, broken specter, which is a literal shadow mm-hmm. created, a light trick created that people will see when they're hiking in the sunlight a certain way up in the mountains or, or something like that, which some person had suggested was what the person saw in our episode where we talked about the uh, praying mantis being, right. uh, however, that was after dark. So that doesn't work for that one. Just a note to that listener. Mm. No sunlight to create it. But still, just all of these possibilities of like these reflections, almost natural mirrors, both yeah. con- subconsciously, consciously, and then and then the idea of the mind. But what what's really fascinating about Julian Jaynes here and what, you know, the origin of consciousness and the breakdown of the bicameral mind. Mm-hmm. It's not only is Julian putting this theory forward, but the implication is that when we look back in history and at our predecessors and earlier versions of humanity, that we're not just looking back at folks that looked a little different from us and made tools from stones. Mm-hmm. They literally perceived the world in an entirely different way from us. Absolutely. You hit the and nail that is, on that. That's head. kind of earth shattering yeah. to think of that way. I've always just thought, oh, this dude that they dug, you know, Otzi, yeah. whoever, they dug him. He doesn't have the benefit of the internet or research or mm-hmm. education. He just knows what he, but it's like, it's more than that. It's actually how he perceives reality could be completely different. And why not? Why wouldn't it be? We should think about that. It's not just what we find. I believe it was on Radio Lab. There's a theory that people of Homer's age, of the Iliad, didn't see color the way that we do now. That has evolved yeah. and changed. Rosy-fingered dawn, widened colored seas. They actually perceive the color blue differently, or maybe not at all, or to a diminished degree than we do now. We've changed. We've evolved a little, even since, uh, I mean, it seems a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, but, you know, yeah, as they were saying 3,000 years ago, we now think differently about consciousness because, you know, with that theory from James... You know, prehistoric humans experienced the products of the right cortical hemisphere as external events in the real world. Images and ideas generated by that hemisphere were interpreted as the presence and communication of a god, a spirit, or some other entity. So everything that's in common with all that, though, is that the person has access to knowledge and wisdom that is beyond the scope of the perceiver. Turn right. If you turn left, that's death. You turn right here, and the person didn't know which way to go at all. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's a guess, but it's knowledge that they would not have known. And that is coming from a God or some higher being that saves their lives. So as they they say here in the passage, you know, so when you have the Iliad, you get advice from the friendly gods that saves the hero's life in battle. Or to us, though, in a modern mind, we just think that's common sense. (laughs) Like Apollo's recommendation here says that Hector tried to avoid Achilles in in single combat. Like, well, if you knew the story, the backstory, like, yeah, that isn't smart. Don't do that. Yeah. You know, in their thinking, that was good advice given to them from a God who knew better. Right. But if the two half of the minds don't know right. what each other knows, then any communication from one to the other seems like information that they couldn't have achieved on their own. Exactly. And maybe disregarding the fact right. that it's a product of their own biology. Exactly. And and that's how they thought that. And that's yeah. how they reason with stuff is that the other half of the mind or maybe it was a, a Greek god. Somebody gave them an idea like, you should do this, idiot. Don't do that. And then they did that and lived and were successful in that. Eventually, over the thousands of years and eons, that diminished. And there were cultural forces here, literacy, linear, clear, logical thinking eventually led us to a, uh, a perception that both halves, hemispheres of your brain, belong to one person, that there's no outside influence. You always talk about that little voice inside your head, right? That's a very common phrase. But we don't nowadays think it's somebody else, unless you people are saying, I'm hearing voices to go do things, and horrible things. We just say like, oh, that's just my conscience, or the good angel on your right shoulder, the devil on your left shoulder, eat the cake. Don't eat the cake. That's an example of that, but we just think it's our imagination nowadays. However, under some situations, as Geiger and Sudfeld suggest, maybe that veil gets torn. And in extreme situations here, that bicameral interpretation reemerges, such as with early childhood, where you can't distinguish between um, an imaginary friend, or maybe it really is, and as we know now, maybe it really is a spirit. (sighs) Or when somebody's not, you know, they're not fully literate, or as they say here, acculturated human being, and they see um, just people that aren't there. Uh, Sometimes you have a psychotic state, 
and you'll get visual and auditory hallucinations. A uh, fever can cause uh, hallucinations like that. Delirium and extreme stress when people experience this. And that's when that bicameral primitive mind emerges to control our thinking. Not to bring everything back to remote viewing. Stop talking about remote viewing. And tulpas. Like, you've been, you've been yeah. very tulpa heavy lately, yeah. sir. Yeah, but isn't it interesting to think of like if remote viewing works and you have sort of this omniscience that you're tapping into and there's mm -hmm. this idea, even when you're learning about remote viewing, that you're sort of tapping into this Akashic record, another term that you used to use all the time. We haven't, haven't so much lately, but like tapping into this great database of knowledge thereby acquiring information that's otherwise, there's no way that you could acquire it. This presents an interesting idea in that maybe part of your mind is just capable of that. Mm -hmm. It's there all the time and we're not tapping into anything. We're not tapping into a great database in the sky right. and an Akashic record. Our minds, a portion of them can do that anytime all you have to do is figure out how to send messages mm -hmm. from the one part to the other part. Well, that, sir, is the great trick, or as uh, uh, Laurie would say, it's like the lamp analogy. The source of the energy, the light bulb, the cord to the user, the, all that connecting. And it might be what Charles Fort would call a wild talent. You know, right. that aspect right. of somebody being able to do that. Well, that's what he thought about humans who were psychic or could do strange premonitions and things like that in that it's an evolutionary advantage uh, over the years and eons that just developed. And what you're seeing here is that uh, we may have had more of that as primitive humans when the world was more magical and we've lost that. But in extreme situations, that again can rear its magnificent, wild, fantastic head. So there's a lot of things then that ultimately this could be. And a lot of folks say, oh, well, these are our guardian angels. This is some being that's come along to help us. It's our departed relatives. It's uh, people yeah. that we knew in our past that are coming back to whether it's the woman who's diving and it's her husband who mm -hmm. used to be in charge of the guideline. These people that are coming to help could be these guardian angels, but yeah. maybe that's too simplistic a point of view. Right. Maybe we're oversimplifying something that's more complicated, and in doing so, we're masking this uh, amazing talent or mm -hmm. ability that all of us have. We just don't know how to tap into it right. on command. And I think there's many different versions of it that you could maybe lump into it. It's like uh, from Jim Harold's uh, was it uh, ghostly trucker stories? The guy driving a semi, lonely uh, midwestern town. I think coming down a, a slope. And he's starting to nod off and suddenly this other semi comes roaring by him and cuts him off and it wing steps up like you so-and-so how did, whoa, what the? it brings him to life and then uh you know he has to uh slow down rapidly and he's taken aback by the image of the semi passing him and cutting him off and then he comes to this intersection and the other semi barrels through it and he kind of comes to a stop and this other truck comes by. He would have been T-boned had right. that truck not passed him and cut him off. Then it dawned on him that that truck looked exactly like his dad, somebody that he drove and who had passed away. And so it was not only just the third man saving him in a drastic action, but a third semi or a second semi <laughs> or maybe the third semi. Uh, but that happened and it, that happens. I hear stories about that all the time, about somebody falling asleep at the wheels and they're hearing a voice like, wake up. Well, yeah, it, it begs the question of the nature of our reality. Right. And I feel like it's hard to look at this series that we've just done and feel like any of us or any of these approaches are actually the right one to figure yeah. out what it is. I feel like maybe we're all barking up the wrong trees. Okay, here. let's go to the other end of the spectrum here or the uh, continuum and uh, look at the very mundane. What does our friend Brian Dunning have to say about this from a skeptical viewpoint? Mr. Dunning, who uh, writes Skeptoid, and, and these are mostly blog entries. He has an interesting one on this, and they're always well-sourced. He lists multiple sources that he's referring to. He talks about uh, acute stress response mm -hmm. and something that he says that he's mentioned a great deal on Skeptoid as a reference to this. And he doesn't, he mentions, of course, Geiger and Geiger's book as bringing this to the forefront when the book came out in the 2000s and it not really being something that's been studied prior to that. But I think we've shown, and specifically you have with some of the research you did for this episode or these episodes for us, that research has been done. It's not super clinical, but mm -hmm. it's there's there's been attempts to figure out what's going on here. 
And the acute stress response is the fight or flight thing. That's what Dunning leans on, and he, he leans on that a lot mm-hmm. for a lot of things. But when you when you read that particular entry about third man syndrome that he wrote, there's a lot of saying, well, you know, the, this is just a phenomenon that happens. You and know. it's very much an, uh, a presentation of, we don't know what causes this, but it's not guardian angels, it's not whatever, which leads me to say, well, look, if, if we don't know what it is, you can't say what it isn't. Mm. It just, that doesn't necessarily work, in my opinion. All due respect to Mr. Dunning. I just mean in general. If mm-hmm. And I find that a lot. It's like, well, we don't know what this, you know, there's, there, we don't have an explanation for this, but it certainly isn't the far out one. And it's like, well, if you don't know what it is, you can't say what it isn't. And there's a lot of language in his analysis of it with phrases like your brain goes into an unusual state. This happens, but without an obvious agreed upon mechanism, uh, it can produce a sensed presence hallucination, even if we don't know exactly why. That's something Mr. Dunning said. So it's like, oh, so it's producing it and we don't know why. Again, If we don't know what it is, we can't say what it isn't. So I don't think we necessarily know. I'm not singling out Mr. Dunning here. Actually, we go to him because he produces some of the best uh, skeptical viewpoints that we can refer to on things. Mm -hmm. There's very few topics that we've tried to cover that he hasn't (laughs) done some sort of entry on. And by his own admission, they are very, uh, those, these entries are brief, Uh, like blog entries uh, with a a quick analysis of these types of topics. Mm -hmm. But I think that ultimately for me, This comes back to, you know, the thing that you sometimes say on the show, you know, don't tell me what I saw. Mm, Don't tell mm. me. And and the other thing that you say a lot is like your experience (laughs) is for you, regardless of what the reasoning is behind why it happened. What does it mean to you? Whether it's a misunderstanding or it's a coincidence that this song came on the radio Mm -hmm. that was your uh, deceased relative's favorite song and you're coming from their funeral and now you hear it on the radio for no reason and it's an obscure song or whether it's a scientific reason or it's just a coincidence. You just happen to look for the pattern. Mm -hmm. You're looking for the pattern like we were just talking about. Whatever that is, is it possible that those things that seem to have no correlation that you can identify clinically or in a scientific form, but that they still mean so much to you is it possible that's just the nature of that presentation and that's the way it's always going to be? Right. So you just have to decide. Is it really a coincidence that that song came on the radio as I was driving back from the funeral or that the flashlight flashed twice when I asked a question on the, you know, in the haunted house? Or (laughs) is all of that just a coincidence? Is it a coincidence every single time? Maybe it is. But did it mean something to you? Does that redefine what it was, I don't know. But it's hard for me to say to any of these folks that have been in these situations, whether it's the Mm -hmm. mountain climbers or uh, the divers or Aaron Ralston, you know, Dunning specifically mentions Ralston in his his entry. And he's like, well, he said he saw a little boy who perceived to be his son came to him and in a vision. And and we read that section. Newsflash, he had a little boy later, and he was a blonde little boy, and he's most certainly playing around with this blonde little boy, and one of his arms, the hand is missing, he has a stump, just as a, that's the thing, you can be like, oh, well, that's crazy, the little boy came to him, and it's like, but that happened, later he (laughs) had that kid, and it's a blonde kid. You know, and of course, lots of people have blonde children, but well, you still, to, I mean, it's you a you pretty have to believe thing. Aaron's story. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, yeah, for yeah. once. Uh, and then the second thing is that yeah. you have to decide, is that just a coincidence out of delirium or was it a premonition? And the other thing is that that happens a lot. You hear that story a lot, especially on, uh, you know, your various paranormal shows where somebody has a vision of a future child, no matter what it is, whatever it was. It saved your life. Well, Forrest, here's something I want to quickly point out about what you just said about Aaron Ralston. And it's like you said, if you believe his story about the little boy right. and the and the vision he had. He wrote that book in 2004. His blonde-headed child was born six years later. Mm-hmm. It's not like he made that story up to fit this future. <laughs> the, that kid right, did not right. exist right. by six, seven years because the the book came out in 2004 and Leo who he would uh, mm-hmm. his son who he would be referring to the blonde-headed little boy was born in 2010. He just had a son just to make that story work. <sighs> Those are the kinds of things. Those are the points that for me it's like all right, well, you can say what you want about these other cases. All mm-hmm. right, that person was delirious, this person was that and these yeah. 
But in that particular story, it's like, wait, you know, this little boy came to me. However, here's another thing, by the way, coming back around to Mr. Dunning, that that Dunning Mm -hmm. says is like, people are cherry picking these stories and lumping them together Mm -hmm. in a way that they don't necessarily line up uh, for common ground. And I agree with that. And that happens a lot with uh, folklore and mythology and Mm -hmm. urban legends. And I've seen a lot in the history of our show where you're like, okay, this is a phenomenon. And it's like, really, when you pick all the cases apart, they're so kind of different that they shouldn't necessarily be lumped together. It's like, all right, well, this is happening in mountain climbing. This is happening scuba diving. This person didn't talk to me. This person did talk to me. This was a relative. This thing gave me, this third man gave me advice. This third man appeared and drove my boat all night while I threw up on the floor. This one wasn't really a third man. It was a little boy. He didn't give me any advice about how to give a, get away. I just had a vision that eventually I would be playing with him. And so, again, I was like, oh, okay, well, let's put all these together and call it one thing. I do feel like sometimes that happens. And I, I think that's one of the things that has been accused of happening in the missing 411 and other yeah. things that get over overly categorized. But by the same token, going back again to Micah Hanks and our episode, The Search for Man Like Monsters in History, a lot of things that are similar sometimes wind up not grouped together because Mm -hmm. they were experienced by different cultures who use different language and different ways of describing things. And in those cases, maybe a lot of things that should be grouped together aren't. So I do think one of the things that happens Mm -hmm. is sometimes things that might collectively be part of a single phenomenon are separated out and it's hard for us to make the connections because they've occurred across many generations of time or cultures and history. And in other cases, I think a lot of things are grouped together that shouldn't necessarily be, this one is not like the other one, but we're treating them all like this one particular phenomenon, which we might have done just now a little bit with this series, even though I still think it's a fascinating idea and I'm very much interested in all the experiences that these folks have had. Again, you can look at it on the flip side in that, it adds to the mystery, and again, that there is no clinical, scientific reasoning that's settled upon by a majority of why or how this happens. I, I think to Mr. Dunning's point, you could, uh, or a physiological standpoint, you could, uh, if it only happened to mountain climbers, you could say, well, there you go. It's the high altitude. It's combined with the sensory deprivation and the high winds. There's something about that. You know, the oxygen in your blood, this and that, combined with exhaustion, and it only is a phenomenon that happens to mountain climbers on only above 14,000 feet. You know, like I said, the more you get very refined, it's like, no, that's something that just only happens to those people. And then it's not as magical. When it happens to many different scenarios, and I get your point about that, because uh, one subject that we were thinking of broaching for maybe part two is the Joplin butterfly people after the severe tornado that happened in, in Joplin, Missouri and people seeing angelic beings, they termed as butterfly people coming to comfort people. Mm -hmm. And uh, in what is that? Is that a third man thing? Is that part of this? Well, I think you can define it that way, but just let's say, talk about, uh, you have mountain climbers and then you have like, it's altitude. No, it's not. It happens to people on the ocean. It happens to people under the ocean or in deep in the ocean. It happens to people in buildings and man-made situations. The fact that it happens to anybody, not everybody, again, and if it happened, that's what I'm saying. It's like, there's all these variables you can plug into this equation. If it happened to everybody who gets stressed out that you start to sense this kind of thing, or you see ghosts in, uh, because you expect it's a haunted house, you expect to see it, and it's just faulty air conditioning that's rattling, causing infrasound in an old building that ain't got no electricity, okay, I don't think it's infrasound or the wind whistling through the, uh, the, the floorboards it's not attributable to one thing, like, but it's a label that people want to slap onto it, like infrasound. And as we, I think we've shown here, it's not the case here. Wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever your mental state, and usually, uh, again, we're talking about people who uh, don't normally see visions and hallucinations, very healthy all around otherwise, are being helped, aided, guided, often physically by an unseen hand or information outside of their scope of knowledge and are saved and guided to safety. And no matter who you are in whatever dire situation you're in, when the chips are down and you're at the end of your rope, there just might be something there to save you.
That's going to wrap up episode 280 of Astonishing Legends and conclude our series on the third man syndrome. Reminder, it's about to be spring break at Astonishing Legends HQ, so the main show is taking an extra week's hiatus before our next episode. We'll be back on April 13th with a new show. In the meantime, look for the Astonishing Junk Drawer on Patreon at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends. Also find and subscribe to the other shows from the Astonishing Legends Network, Scared All the Time, which will be dropping new shows weekly as they do with their seasons, and the premiere of Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf on John Keel's birthday, March 25th. That will be posted to its own feed, but we're also releasing it to the Astonishing Legends main feed shortly after. The Midnight Library is on hiatus at the moment, but Miranda just finished the ninth season of that, so there's plenty to enjoy there too. Find Scared All the Time, Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf, and The Midnight Library wherever you get your podcasts. Astonishing Legends is edited by Sarah Voorhees Wendell at VW Sound and co-produced by Tess Feifel, who is also head of research and the social media manager. Our technical producer is Ed Vicola, or as we call him, The Mechanic. Special thanks to our announcer, John Bolin. Hi. Hi. Hi, I'm Bob Morey. I'm Julia Covington. I'm Jeff Goff. Galaxy wide. Galaxy wide. In perpetuity. I understand this is with no implied promise. No implied promise. With no implied promise of J E F F. Our theme, which is available as a ringtone, was composed by Judson Crane at FounderMusic.com. All other music and sound design for the show is composed and created by Alan Caressia. Our logo was created by Tommy Beaver Design, and our animated graphics for social media and YouTube are done by Joshua Sloan at DeadStreetProductions.com. Every episode going back to September of 2020 has a transcription available on its corresponding webpage at our website. Earlier transcriptions can be made available upon request to AstonishingContact at gmail.com. Astonishing Legends would not be possible without you, our listeners. Visit our store at AstonishingLegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Instagram, Twitter, Discord, Facebook, and YouTube. You can also visit us at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends, where patrons have access to additional bonus content, including the Patreon-exclusive show, Astonishing Junk Drawer, which is available every week the main show is not. No part of this show may be reproduced anywhere without permission. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night. Good night.